Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Peace upon all of you everywhere, either in India, uh, the, Cali the Florida, London, Egypt, and everywhere. Uh, we are pleased and uh, honored today to have a great experts and uh, a very uh, eminent surgeons in the field of cornea. Uh, and the refractive surgeries as well, also the cataract. And this is the, 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 the topic of interest for the old ophthalmologists everywhere because we are uh, facing in all our live experiences the corneal problems, especially the corneal infections. And everyone should know about the diagnosis, about the differentiation, and how to, uh, how to judge the different uh, uh, causative organisms of the of the of the keratides or infective keratides, and at the same time, he can even uh, guide the patient and send him to the cornea consultant for us without starting any um, uh, any wrong treatments. And uh, so you are, all of you are welcome in the same the other grand round which is the Zoom room conducting uh, uh, meetings about the, uh, the cornea, refractive and the cataract subjects. And we are honored today to have uh, Professor Hermander Dua, Professor of Thermology and the, uh, in the Nottingham University, UK. And everyone knows who is the Dua layer discoverer, which changed it the, the, the minds and the changes the textbooks about the anatomy of the cornea and still still keeping the changing of the revolutionary uh, aspects about the cornea surgery as we have known the, the last Friday. Thank you, Dr. Dova, for your participation and for your time. Okay. Uh, also, we have uh, Professor Rajesh Sina, a professor of ophthalmology from uh, Delhi, India, professor in the All India Institute of the Medical Science, uh, and cornea cataract and refractive surgeon, well known one, and has a great experience in the in the, in the field of corneal surgeries. Also, I am honored to have my dear friend Professor Sonal Tolly, chairman of ophthalmology department, Florida University, USA is an eminent corneal surgeon and have a lot of experiences in the field of the corneal infections, also the corneal ablative surgeries. Thank you for all. Uh, and I will ask, I may ask Professor Doha to start his presentation about the bacterial keratides. Thank you, let me share yeah. my screen. Yes, sir. <clears throat> So let's okay. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hossam. Uh, like you said, we we're meeting uh, twice in two weeks. I'm going to talk about very practical approach to the management of uh, bacterial keratitis. Um, these are my declarations of interest. Um, and moving quickly forward. So bacterial, viral, uh, I'm sorry, I'm saying viral, but microbial keratitis can be viral, it can be bacterial, it can be fungal, be parasitic, and even what I call exotic because this was actinomycosis. We're going to focus uh, in my talk on bacterial keratitis. And like everything else, it cannot be over some emphasized in ophthalmology that history is the key. And in our experience in, in Nottingham, these are the commonest causes of severe bacterial ulcer, contact lens wear. And you can see this patient has got all kinds of calcium deposits and colonies going on a soft contact lens, trauma, previous surgery, and in previous surgery, any surgery which sutures that le are left behind is very important. Like you see corneal crafts, ocular surface disease, recurrent history of cold sores gives you some idea 
and not to forget nasolacrimal obstruction. So when we look at the examination of the patient after taking a thorough history, think anatomy. Start with the eyelids and move backwards towards the back of the eye as far as is visible. Um, one should also for, not forget that in ophthalmology, we always have something between us and the patient. You know, it's either the slit lamp or a lens or an ophthalmoscope or whatever. We should move all of these things away and just look at the face of the patient, get so much more information if they've got rosacea, if they've got some other rash, um, look at the blink rate of the patient, look at the eyebrows, you will see whether the forehead is wrinkled or not, there's facial palsy or not. All these features we must look at before we actually start examining the eyes. So look at the patient as a whole, not just the eyes. And the, when you come to the examination of the lids, then obviously we know the different types of blepharitis, the anterior, which can be squamous or ulcerative, and the posterior, which is mybomitis. Then we look at the conjunctiva. Eversion of the lid, I think, should be standard part of any clinical examination of a patient who comes with ocular surface problems. And this is very rarely done. And, and we look for papillae, we look for follicles. Both of these are non-specific manifestations of chronic inflammation. Papillae are usually related to allergic eye disease and follicles to viral. But like I said, they're both non-specific manifestations. The nasolacrimal sac, one can just press on the inner corner of the eye to see for regurgitation or do a proper syringing if one is suspicious of an obstruction. Now, after the conjunctiva, the tendency is to jump to the cornea, but think of the limbus as another anatomical feature and look at the limbus carefully. Limbitis is a very, very pathognomic feature of both HSV keratitis and acanthamoeba and of other conditions as well. And you will see a swollen edematous limbus, as you see over here, the pooling of the dye. Even in this two-dimensional picture, you can see there's limbal edema. And again, close to the limbus, you might sometimes see the radial keratinuritis of acanthamoeba. And one of the things I've found in examination, if you don't look for something, you're not going to see it. So if you look systematically at all these structures, you will pick up findings instead of going straight to the obvious lesion, which is the white spot in the center of the cornea in bacterial keratitis. And then comes this uh, fluorescein staining, extremely crucial, very important. And when we look at the epithelium, put a drop of one or two percent fluorescein, keep it there for uh, a few seconds, then put some drops of uh, BSS or saline, let the tear film break holding the lids apart so that the tear film is broke. And then you can see very, very different kinds of staining patterns, fine SPK, coarse SPK, a combination of the two, where they are located. And if there's any pattern to this, so you can see it's not so clear on the diffuse view here, but when you put fluorescein, the pseudodendrites of acanthamoeba keratitis become very obvious. And these are the parts taken by the acanthamoeba as they migrate across the surface of the cornea eating the cell. So it's important to wait for that little bit with fluorescein stain, let the tear film break up, and then you'll see these features underneath. Once you've finished examining the epithelium, then you look at the stroma. And here it's usually ulcers and infiltrates. And this uh, bacterial keratitis patient, the two seem to correlate, but that's not always the course. As the condition progresses, you will find the epithelial defect size and shape changes quite this irrespective of the size and shape of the stromal infiltrates. Here you also see a hypopion. But that, like you see here, this is healing. The infiltrate seems more or less the same, but part of this is now scar tissue. Not all of it is infiltrate. So one has to document and record at least the longest two dimensions of uh, the infiltrate and the epithelial defect separately. In the stroma, we look for thickening. We look for melts over here. And if there's extreme thinning, we look for perforation. Again, with 2% fluorescein drops. To remember that if it is an extremely soft eye, you may get sidles negative or the positive sidle may not show unless you put a gentle pressure on the globe, very gentle uh, uh, to pick up the perforation. But that is unusual. Most of the time, it's pretty obvious. Uh, 
in the stroma and in the epithelium and in the depths, look for blood vessels. And I would uh, recommend this paper, which if I may say so myself, I put in the BJO in 2015 on characterization of coronal vascularization. So you can now tell whether these are active young vessels, as you see in these two pictures, they're active old, they're partially regressed or they're mature or fully regressed. But one thing very useful about vessels is that they tend to follow the plane of the pathology. So if you see superficial vessels, then there is superficial keratitis. The deep vessels, there's keratitis profunda or deep or mid stroma. Accordingly, you'll see more mid stromal vessels, at least in the early to intermediate stage of the disease. So very good clue as to where to focus your attention. Uh, here are some partially regressed blood vessels. This is a regressing uh, blood vessel, but more of this a little later. You might see immune rings. The immune rings are nothing but uh, uh, antigen antibody complex precipitates in the stroma, and they can be bacterial or viral. You often see them in uh, herpes disease, but they are not pathognomic. They can be in bacterial keratitis or other forms of uh, um, infections. Um, then you move on to the endothelium, and there you will see plaques of different shapes and size, you will see keratic precipitates. And here you can see there's a superficial ulceration and superficial vessels growing on the cornea with keratic precipitates. And these keratic precipitates can sometimes be more obvious. So it can be, in some instances, the toxins from the ulcer that go through the stroma into the anterior chamber and instigate vasodilation and iritis, or it can be a non-specific iris uh, inflammation that is causing cells to come out, but those KPs are much more fine and more evenly distributed in a triangular manner. Uh, here are some endothelial plaques again, and of course then you look for anterior chamber depth, for irregularity, for presence of hypopion or hyphema, and when you get a shape like this, a convex shape which is not flat, then you know this is more or less organized hypopion, much more fibrinous and tenacious compared to a very flat line like you see here, it's much more liquid and fluid. Uh, sometimes you see a combination of blood and pus, so you have a, um, a, a, a hypopion and a hyphema together. Then you look at the iris, you will see iris dilation, uh, vessels are dilated, uh, you will see pupil, you may see sinique, occluded pupil, or secluded pupil. So if the pupil has got 360 degree sinique, it's a secluded pupil, if there's a fibrin blob blocking the pupil, that's an occluded pupil. Uh, dilated vessels are usually not new vessels, although they can be, but it's often just a reaction to the inflammatory response. So all that needs to be looked for and documented. Then go beyond the sclera. You can see uh, nodular scleritis, diffuse scleritis, and sometimes you can see actually the infection moving from the cornea and infected pseudomonas cornea graft with pseudomonas infection of the sclera. So scleritis, extreme pain the patient feels, and it needs a very much more aggressive treatment approach when you see that. With refractive surgery and lamellar corneal surgery, the patterns of clinical manifestation are changing. They tend to follow the planes here under the LASIK flap. And not to forget that when you have poor corneal sensations or the host response is absent, then the pattern is very different like that of an infectious crystalline theatopathy where there are no host immune cells, only the bacterial colonies migrating in this Christmas tree needle-like pattern. So once you've done your clinical examination, this is the second, after lid diversion, this is the second neglected test in corneal examination is corneal sensation. Absolutely crucial. We have different ways of doing it, but the cotton whisk is just the, the simplest and the easiest bedside way of doing it. But test in the center, test in the four quadrants, and test the cornea and the conjunctival sensations separately because the cornea can be absent and the conjunctival sensations can be present. If you have a kosher bonnet, then that's good. If not, then just the wisp is fair enough. Not to forget the pressure. The problem is that often there's a big abscess in the cornea. You can't use any instrument to measure the pressure, so it's ignored. Now, you can use the toner pen, you can use the eye care, but more often it's just your palpation with your finger that you can do because Goldman is rarely possible if there's a large central bacterial ulcer. So the point is try to assess the pressure whichever way you can. Even just palpation is good. If you're experienced, you will know what the pressure is. And often you spend hours and days and weeks treating the ulcer 
and you end up with a blind eye because of an excavated disc. So be wary of that. Uh, if you have confocal microscopy, it can help you diagnose Campanuba cis or fungal hyphae. Those are the two areas where it's most uh, efficacious and most uh, informative, but sometimes dendritic cells in the cornea may look like uh, um, uh, fungal hyphae. Uh, OCT is very useful. Uh, you can see lots of things happening in the cornea here. The iris is stuck to the cornea. How much of the ulceration, how the depth of the ulceration, whether, whether there's been a perforation which has sealed with iris, all the rest of that information and the density of the cornea, extremely useful, I think, uh, almost more useful than an IVCM, I would say. Um, and here again, from the density itself, you can tell how the activity is. The greater the density, the more the shadowing behind and you can see the wrinkling goes all the way to the endothelium. You, you see, we see these concentric rings along an area of ulcer, and that represents the extent to which the edema has spread. And you can see these are folds in the, in the cornea uh, stroma as well as in the endothelium giving you that clinical picture. And as the ulcer heals, the density becomes less. You can measure the density even with Scheimflag imaging. And we published on this a while ago that uh, the density, not just in the area of the ulcer, but across the entire cornea, increases uh, with a bacterial infection. And as the infection recedes, the density on the cornea improves before the density of the actual lesion. So if you have that, it's a useful way to objectively document uh, the intensity of the inflammation. Laboratory investigations, scrapes and swabs, gram stain and culture, for impression cytology and biopsy. All these are important, the biopsy for culture and, and PCR. Uh, there are certain things, I think, always liaise with your microbiologist. Let the plates come to normal temperature before you plate them. Do not break the surface, just plate it on the top. Make a C mark or a pattern. And the reason for that is only bacteria growing in that pattern are pathognomic, the rest might be contaminants. So that's the idea of, of doing that and take a scrape from the tissue, don't get the discharge because that often gives a poor yield. Coming to the treatment, once you've done all of this, we have three groups of antibiotics and this is what we follow. We have the aminoglycosides, the cephalosporins and the fluoroquinolones. If the ulcer is non-site threatening, we use monotherapy with the fluoroquinolone, usually levofloxacin or moxifloxacin, and we can give that six to eight times a day you can treat the patient as an outpatient. So non-site threatening, meaning a peripheral ulcer, with less than three millimeters um, uh, in size uh, without a whole uh, amount of anterior chamber reaction. But if it is a central ulcer greater than three millimeter, if there is hypopion or if there's any ulcer related to a contact lens, so even if it is a peripheral ulcer, but if it's contact lens related, you would treat that as site threatening and tend to treat that patient usually with a, a dual antibiotic regime and sometimes, uh, in fact, 50-50 chance we might even admit the patient. If you don't admit, we call them back the next day and the following day to see progress to therapy. So we start with the antibiotics. For us, Kepiroxim, 10% every five minutes for 30 minutes. This is the loading dose. You can achieve concentrations with this dose as much as you can with a subconjunctival injection. We used to use gentamicin and tobramycin a lot. They're not so readily available now, so we're using amicacin. But I think uh, gentamicin or tobramycin are equally group, uh, good, so 1.5%. And you alternate the two for 30 minutes. And then you start off with the, the uh, early and two early regimes as the response uh, is seen to the, to the, to the treatment. Uh, so monotherapy, uh, Clearly, like I said, nowadays we're using moxifloxacin and sometimes levofloxacin. This is available as preservative free drops as well. So you can um, alternate on the half hour, that means each drug is hourly for maximum of 48 hours. Usually within 24 hours, you should see a response. And if you don't see a response, then you have to stop and scrape and start again. But if you see a response, then you taper according to the clinical response but do not taper antibiotics like you taper steroids because that will result in resistance. Intrastromal injections, I, have, I don't think I have done this for many, many years. Uh, I, I, I just prefer topical drops, but it has been well described in the literature. You can, various regimes, you can inject 
all around the, the lesion, you can inject at one point, um, et cetera. Uh, but if you give intensive topical, like I said, you can achieve the same concentration as a subconjunctival or perhaps even an intracoronal injection. There are other medications. You have to give systemic antibiotics if uh, the sclera is threatened. So 750 milligram twice a day of ciprofloxacin. We use doxycycline as a protease inhibitor to stop the melting. And of course, the midriatic drops and anti glaucoma medications. I don't use drops because we're already putting so many drops. Oral acetylzolamide if the palpation pressure seems to be high. And of course, analgesia. So when do we use steroids? Uh, my dictum is use steroids in some critical situations, like if there's a choreograph, only when there is documented response to your antibiotic treatment. So usually only after 24 to 48 hours. And the reason is to reduce the inflammation, also to pr protect against rejection. Uh, and here, this example, you can see it did respond reasonably well. Uh, what are the indicators of improvement? The first thing is pain is reduced. Second is discharge becomes less, and you will find that the infiltrate edge is becoming less, um, um, defi less diffuse, less feathery, they become more defined, and then the swelling becomes less, and the, the epithelialization then comes later. So a lot of things will happen as good indicators of your response to therapy before you wait for the epithelial uh, regrowth to occur. You might see this often, the signs improve uh, or, or don't improve at all and they continue to worse, like I said, stop and then re-scrape. If there are worsening signs after initial improvement, this happens also very time, patient getting better, we all think we're doing well and then it starts getting worse or stops improving. And here it could be yeast infection, there's underlying fungal or acanthamoeba, check for the sensitivity, by this time your results should come back and you will know whether the drug is uh, corresponding to the sensitivity test from the lab, or quite often, particularly if you're using the aminoglycosides in a fortified strength, it could be drug toxicity. And this is one sign we published a while ago, which is called the up-down sign. You ask the patient to look up, and you ask the patient to look down. You see the difference in congestion, a clear sign of toxicity. You might see these plaques, and they will stain uh, conjunctival ulceration, and that is a clear sign because toxicity is due to dose and it's due to dependency in the lower phonics that causes this problem. Um, it does respond well to therapy, as you can see uh, quite often. Um, if it is not, and it leaves behind a neurotrophic type ulcer or non inhaled ulcer, then you can use bandage contact lens. If it's perforating, then cyanoacrylate glues. Even fibrin glue could be used, but in the background of infection, the cyanoacrylate glue is better as you see over here. And if there's large perforations and loss of tissue that has to be excised because of necrosis and perforation, then you can do emergency tectonic grafts at the same time. And later on, you can come back like in this patient to do a, a visually rehabilitating uh, penetrating graft. Um, uh, Tassaraf is the gold standard for non-healing defects, multilayered amniotic membrane. And these are for herpetic melts, but for any melts, and one thing we found that if there's an ulcer not responding to treatment, you can stick an amniotic membrane on it and carry on with the same treatment and it tends to respond. So that's unusual. We don't know exactly why, but there are some publications on that. And then um, if there's vascularization, so active vessels will respond to the anti-VEGFs and drops or injections, but the mature vessels like these or the established vessels, no capillary network, there we tend to use this fine needle diathermy occlusion we insert a, a tenor monofilament nylon and then use a monopolar pottery uh, to occlude these vessels. And this is now very, we've been doing this for more than 20 years now, or at least 15, 16 years. And it's very effective intraoperatively, preoperatively um, to, uh, to treat vessels before you, um, you know, even to treat rejection. And in this case, we were doing a therapeutic graft. Uh, and then nowadays we combine this with the limbal injection of Evastin uh, to reduce any new vascularization that would be triggered by the chemical burn. Uh, penetrating grafts then come in either some very rarely. We have to do therapeutic grafts. The outcomes are not so good, but for visual rehabilitation afterwards to treat the scars. Uh, they can be lamellar or full thickness, and I'm not going to go into details of those. But this is a new kid on the block. This relatively new collagen cross-linking for infectious keratitis 
There are mixed reports and the jury is still out. We have used it and, and published some, uh, some uh, work on this. The only thing I'd like to point out to you is that after you do cross-linking, immediately next day the hypopion gets worse. That's not a sign of uh, worsening of the disease. It's a sign that the cross-linking has had some effect. The theory is that a lot of dead bacteria and you get an increased inflammation in inflammatory response, but then it all settles over time. And then I call this back to the future. When nothing else works, povidine iodine, chlorhexidine, like these we use for acantamoeba, silver nitrate, carbolic acid, even cryo, all these we have tried in cases which are really, really bad. And sometimes they do work. So in summary, good patient workup, good medical management with the antimicrobial, antiproteases, and anti-glaucoma medication, and the surgical treatment, a whole host of them to treat the infection, to treat and remove necrotic tissue for visual rehabilitation, and to manage the sequelae, and then also to treat the non-healing defects that are left after the infection is controlled. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, sir, for the great presentation. As usual, you are surprising us uh, by your uh, 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 eminent and different uh, showing of the subjects. Uh, you, you have shown it in very systematic way, uh, and and based on based on yeah, it's 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 systematic, and at the same time, it's stepped to start first from the um, from the diagnosis, from the investigation. And uh, also, if you are query, if you are uh, uh, suspecting if this infection is not uh, bacterial or not, you can find the clues. But le le let me ask you about the, the sign. When you find it either in the response of the patient to the treatment or in the patient side itself, you can suggest that this, that this sign is a toxicity but not the persistent infection itself. But you know, just repeat the last bit. Uh, your voice is soft today. I don't know why. <laughs> Excuse me, I missed this word. Just, yeah, just, just uh, repeat the last part of your, the, your question. Yeah, the, the question. Uh, I may have in my clinic patients with, um, with a history of infection, but still on the treatment for more than three months of antibiotics. I, I may find in the prescription of the patient many times of antibiotics, including the, the uh, gram-negative, the gram-positive, the atypical bacteria, more than four antibiotics. And they are following on this uh, for then more than three months. How I know that the sign of this uh, the patient or the signs present in this patient's eye is a toxicity from the drugs and not the persistent infection itself. Um, if it is three months, that's a very long time to be yes. treated with so many antibiotics. And if the bacteria were not responding, then you would have had a fulminant infection that's going on. And for example, if they're a resistant strain and there would be clear signs of spreading of the infection and a lot of AC activity. But if uh, there are a lot of inflammation and this is usually the case. There is the, the cornea has been rendered sterile, but because the epi defect is not healing and there is stromal necrosis, you keep adding more antibiotics. And then you create a non-healing defect. You create a neurotrophic defect because the nerves are severely damaged in these patients and you're treating it with the wrong things. They will, that will not respond to antibiotics. Antibiotics will make it worse, as you said. Toxicity might be one, one reason. So the best thing to do is to stop everything. Yes. Right? Yeah. Let the patient be for two or three days without absolutely any drops going in the eye and then see what happens. If he starts to get better, then you know it was the treatment that's causing it. And it might be that there is still some lingering infection, but then you can do another biopsy and find that out. But the first thing I would do is stop everything and see how it responds. Okay, perfectly. I can use the, the stain to know if there's, um, if there's a surface staining. This may, may denote epithelial defects. Uh, but what, 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 what about the uh, corneal infiltrates? 
if, if, if I have a coordinate infiltrates, a stromal infiltrates beyond this defective epithelium, this may denote something? See, an infiltrate is a collection of cells due to inflammation. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that due to bacteria in there. So you, we see a lot of stromal infiltrates in autoimmune diseases, yes. right? You yeah, see okay. peripheral corneal, you know, PUK, um, we call it keratitis, ulcers, whatever, you get infiltrates. Yeah. So with contact lens, you get what we call sterile infiltrates, but they're all inflammatory cells. So if you have drug toxicity and persistent inflammation, you will still have an infiltrate, which is not necessarily due to a bacterial infection. But if you have stopped everything and the infiltrate is not receding, then do a biopsy with a skin biopsy punch, take a three millimeter biopsy, don't go smaller. Try to uh, put the biopsy, the, the trifine on the edge of the infiltrate and take a bit of normal cornea. And then you can send it for histology. They can do special stain, including gram stain, and take another biopsy, which you send for PCR and culture. So at least two biopsies, if not three, because the objective in these ulcers is to first get the infection to heal and the cornea to heal, never mind the vision. Your main objective is not sight at this point, is save the eye. Yeah. And therefore, if you take three biopsies, it's not a problem. People say, oh, we'll be damaging the cornea. No, you, you, that, the cornea is already damaged. So take your multiple biopsy, get a diagnosis, get it to heal. Then you come back at the second stage, your objective changes. Now, how can I get sight back into this side? And then you come back with, with the other options you have for visual rehabilitation. Yeah, okay. But what, uh, what about the depth of the scrapping or, or the biopsy? What about the depths uh, uh, it's preferred to do? So, like I said, I first wipe out all the discharge yeah. that is there. And then look at the ulcer. If you're looking at a you know, patient within one week of the ulcer comes to you, there are areas you can see where the, the ulcer might be active. Sometimes it might be active all around, but with classically with, uh, with pneumococcal infection, you get the serpiginous ulcer. It's more white at, and infiltrated at one edge, <coughs> excuse me, and less at the other. And that will grow for a while. Then that will stop and it'll start at another place. So you can tell that that is the site you want to scrape. But if there is no such clear indication, it doesn't matter. So you wipe the discharge and you have to take the superficial scrapes from, yeah. from, from that area. Very rarely you will find that there's an infiltrate in the depth, in keratitis profunda, for example, which means it's nothing more than mean, that it's a deep keratitis. So the profunda means deep. Uh, then, and the surface is pretty okay. Even the epithelium is intact. Then what you do is you do like a flap, you create a flap, you go down, and then you take a scrape or biopsy from the actual infiltrate and you put the flap back down. So but that's, that's rare, but if that's how you can deal with it, but you have to get the material where you think the infection is. Okay, but the problem here, sir, is uh, to, to get the, this biopsy or to get this smear or scrapping after a long time of antibiotic therapy. So uh, I can trust this biopsy results about the bacterial uh, presence or absence? No, no. So sorry to interrupt, but that's what I said. If it is within the first few days, if it is after a long time of antibiotic therapy, you have to stop all antibiotics for at least 24 hours, ideally 48 hours before you take a scrape. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, you, 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 you like it to get. And then even the scrape, you know, how you take it, how much you take it, how you plate it, and on what. And you know, there are, we have a panel of, uh, we have the Sabrods medium, we have the chocolate agar, we have the anaerobic, aerobic, yeah. get a broth. So if you put it in a broth, you can expand the organism before you then culture in the laboratory. So we do all of that, make sure you've taken it from the fridge, kept it to equilibrate at room temperature and not put it back in the fridge. If, if it's late in the evening, keep it at room temperature, otherwise the bacteria won't grow. And, and then, you maximize your chance of getting a positive response. Now, even when you do all of this, the culture positive rates are usually below 60%, even in the best of them. We just published a couple of papers on this from our experience. So we're now trying to maximize our positive rates uh, by taking special swabs, which, you know, the, the, the flock swab is good. It attaches, the bacteria attached to it better 
And in the medium, it releases the bacteria better, so you get a larger dose or larger inoculum of the organism with the floxorb. So you will often find that there is no culture uh, that you get. And then in that case, you just have to rely on your clinical judgment. Okay, thank you perfectly. Uh, you. I covered this point, uh, but le let me ask about the, if you have a donut with a, with a corneal opacity, in case of corneal, uh, in case of um, uh, infective keratitis, but but I, I I may ask about the clo sign to define to differentiate between if this is bacterial or fungal because in some situation or in some um, uh, in some uh, stage they may resemble each other. Clinically, it's very difficult to tell. <clears throat> I think Rajesh will be able to tell you better and even. Even Sonal, because they work in environments where they have a lot more fungal. Yeah. We don't see that many fungal here in, in the UK. And, and my learning through the years has been never try to diagnose the organism just by looking at the ulcer. You can be caught out quite badly, even for a cantamoeba. But you can get some idea from your experience and use that judgment in, in what line of treatment you would start with. First, you might try both antifungal and antibiotics are only one. So that's where that uh, comes in handy. But uh, infections from, from donor grafts are, are uh, difficult. They're often fungal. Uh, at least when, when we get them, we, of course, we, we examine the, the medium. So this is one thing. You ask your residents, why is that medium pink? I can tell you, six out of 10 won't know why it's pink, you know, the donor medium, if it's an organ culture tissue. If you're using octisol and all, it's not pink. And, yeah. and that is the first sign that you know that there's a pH indicator. And if there's bacterial contamination, it changes to more and more yellowy and less pink. And mm -hmm. you know that there is some metabolic activity going on inside. You don't use that cornea. So we, we often see that, you know, very rare, but occasionally the color has changed and you know this is contaminated. Uh, okay, but actually, uh, do you agree that the prescriptions uh, for the corneal infections may include both together? The of course. The even, even, even you fungal? know, you can see more than two. Polymicrobial, um, if I remember right, we see polymicrobial infection, which means there might be either two bacteria even, two different bacteria, or you might see... Um, and one of them can be resistant and one is responsive to your treatment, or it can be with fungus or with acanthamoeba. Often acanthamoeba is, is with more than one infection, uh, uh, bacterial and acanthamoeba, and even viral. So viral can be uh, super added with the bacterial. And the interesting thing there is that the, the pain the patient feels is much less than you would expect for a bacterial ulcer in somebody uh, with normal Corneal sensation. So if you see a bacterial ulcer and, and the patient's pain is less, then suspect a viral background. Yeah, okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, the, the question, the questions about this, uh, uh, this topic is not stopping, but for the continuation of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the continuation for the other pathogens, and then we will collect the old pathogens together to discuss about. So we have to go now for the Florida, for Dr. Sonal to, uh, to know about the fungal keratides. Uh, please, Dr. Sonal, thank share, you. share your thank you. can, I, can I just have one query from Prasadua? Sir, what's your experience about the suture biopsy before actually going into the you know, skin, using the skin punches? What is your experience on uh, suture biopsy? Is, uh, <laughs> So, I, I, I mean, the, I can answer two ways. So, I, when there is a suture-related abscess, the first thing you do is you take the suture out and you put it in a broth for culture. So, that's like a suture biopsy, but not what you mean. What you mean is you pass the suture to the infiltrate. Absolutely. And you culture Absolutely. That. So, yeah. if you're going to do that, I would recommend that you, you can do it, but make sure you put it in a broth. If you try to plate with it, what happens is that um, you don't have enough volume of the, the, the organisms. And you expand it in the broth for 24 hours and then your microbiologist will tell you they will take that and then plate it to get the colony features and to try and identify the organism. So 
that is is one approach but what i have done is i have i have used uh, the needle without the suture or the suture is the second use a needle tip to dig in for a deep and then get some material on needle tip and very gently put that needle tip on the agar plate without breaking the surface of the plate and once you've broken the surface then you don't see the colony characteristics at all because everything is inside uh, and they may not even grow so then i gently touch the tip uh, to the uh, plate uh, agar in a c pattern and then go back in and dig more with the needle tip so that helps in getting deeper material okay thank you thank you dr rajesh you. for this tricky question and thank good, you good point what? thank you yeah, yeah thank you very much excuse me dr sonal you can re resume again hi thank you so much for this invitation i um i wish i was in egypt right now but i will make do with just a picture of egypt yeah you're so thank back. you for uh, uh -huh. for the invitation to speak yeah. uh, so i'm going to be talking on fungal keratitis which uh, at least in florida is becoming a mushrooming problem we're seeing more and more of these cases all the time i have no financial interests or relationships and so how often you see fungal ulcers as dr dua said depends on where you are um so i certainly see more than dr dua probably and rajesh probably sees 10 times as many as all of us combined um so it's much higher in tropical uh, climates than in um than in the the temperate climates and in the tropical climates you tend to see more filamentous fungus but we see a fair number of yeast also whereas in the temperate climates you'll see more yeast um and the incidence like i mentioned is going up um traditionally we would always teach people that uh, fungal ulcers happen after trauma and that's certainly the case in a lot of countries in the world uh but in the us um the the contact lenses have overtaken trauma as the number one cause of fungal ulcers it's also much harder to treat and to diagnose in the first place um and we end up doing more transplants in fungal ulcers than we do in bacterial so um if you treat bacterial ulcers well there's a good chance you can get through at least the acute phase and end up with a scar and then treat that as dr dua said but in fungal they're more likely to need therapeutic transplants and lose vision and so we look at a lot of fungi that we are interested in but the ones that we usually see in the clinic or more interested in are the the yeast like candida and then the septate uh, fungi which are fusarium either non pigmented or pigmented um and again as dr dua said you never want to make a diagnosis based on what you see but when a patient walks in the door that's when you start making a, a sort of start thinking about what this could be so there are contact lens wearer they come in and they haven't had their they've had their symptoms for longer than a day or two um you start thinking it may be an unusual organism something like acanthamoeba or fungus because bacteria grow very rapidly a back one bacteria becomes two bacteria in 20 minutes so within a day or two they've grown substantially whereas in fungi and in acanthamoeba they grow very slowly but what are some of the other features that we look for where your brain starts thinking maybe i'm dealing with something more than just a bacteria and that way you can be increase your suspicion but also maybe start therapies therapies that are different earlier on and so we look at some of these features uh, in more detail So the one on the left is obviously not a fungal ulcer right that is a classic pseudomonas ulcer you can see it's got soupy uh, infiltrate and you've got a hypopian you've got lots of discharge but when you look at an ulcer that looks like the bottom left corner you can see it looks very different it's much drier and it's got these feathery borders so you can actually see distinct borders they look ugly but they're distinct borders as opposed to these pseudomonas ulcers where they'll have more diffuse borders um and much more dry ulcers and here again you can see these sort of feathery branchy out um outlines of these ulcers and in this case you can also see that there are mutton fat or granulomatous keratic precipitates from the endothelium as you saw earlier so these things start making you think it's a much drier eye there's not as much discharge it doesn't look red hot um and so it's it's a more indolent organism um and then when you see these infiltrates and you see satellite ulcers again that should start make you start thinking that this may not be a true pseudomonas ulcer or bacterial gram positive or negative ulcer 
and we looked at ring ulcers previously. And so when you start seeing rings, you should start thinking gram negative organisms can certainly cause rings. But when you see feathery borders or organisms or infiltrates that look more dry with a ring around them, you should start thinking fungus. Again, we talked about a hypopian earlier. Dr. Dua mentioned this. So normally when you see a hypopian from PMNs um, that lines up like a little boat in the anterior chamber, so the white blood cells settle at the bottom and make a nice layered hypopian. When you see a hypopian that has a mind of its own, it looks more like a mountain than a boat. Um, that tells you that there's something unusual going on, much more significant inflammation, infection or inflammation uh, but also in the case of a fungus, you should now start thinking that this fungus is probably inside the eye now. And fungus can do that. So unlike bacteria, which typically the hypopian is a, is a, a, a reactive hypopian. So it's PMNs in the anterior chamber reactive to the inflammation that you have. In fungal ulcers, the fungus can actually penetrate through an intact cornea and create these um, endothelial plaques or formed, what we call formed hypopia, where they, they have a shape of their own. And then if you see pigmentation in an infiltrate, that should make you start thinking fungus again, like a dermatitious fungus, where there's pigmentation of the fungus. And this patient actually came in to see me. We had diagnosed him with a fungus, a fungal ulcer, and he was lost to follow up and came back. And this is actually an aspergilloma sitting in his anterior chamber. So this was a nice little ball of fungus sitting in the anterior chamber, once it forms that, it's very hard to treat it medically. We had to cut this out and take it out, just, and it looked just like a little tennis ball in the anterior chamber. So those are some of the things you would start thinking, maybe I'm dealing with a fungus. But what if you don't know for sure? Obviously, you want to do a diagnosis. We talked about these earlier. You want to do smears. And the smears that you would send, the, the stains that you would send it for would be a little bit different from bacteria. So KOH stains, would you can do acutely, and, uh, but you need a fresh specimen. We tend to send more of these silver stains, so gomorimethamine silver, uh, or GIMSA stains, uh, sometimes calcofluoride if you can get that. Same thing with cultures. If you culture these, because fungus grows very slowly and sometimes you can have a mixed infection, and in that case, the bacteria will overwhelm the plate. The Sabaral plate has antibacterials on it, so when you plate it on the surface of a, of a Sabaral plate, it, it in inhibits the growth of bacteria, and you will be more likely to grow fungus. So that's what we tend to use, but there are other growth media that you can use. And we looked at confocals, but we'll talk about that in a minute. And again, how do you obtain the specimen? But if it's a bacterial ulcer and there's pseudomonas, no matter what you culture, you'll probably get a positive culture. You'll get that six, more than probably 60% positivity. But with a fungal ulcer, it's much less likely to be positive. Remember that the fungus is growing in the edges. Sometimes in the center, you have necrotic fungus. So you might want to scrape it from an infected area, but at the edges of the ulcer. You have to be much more aggressive because the fungus is actually growing into the lamellae of the cornea. So you definitely want to scrape a little bit harder in these cases. We talked about biopsy, so I won't mention that. And we talked about the suture method of passing it through the ulcer. And sometimes if you see these formed hypopia, you can actually tap the anterior chamber and get a specimen through that. Though it's usually very sticky, so you need a large bore tube of some sort to get this uh, infiltrate out of the anterior chamber. But with the stain, you can see the conidia, you can see the branching filaments. And then with the culture plate, you can see the candida, little balls of candida, or you can see this aspergillus with the pigment that's growing confluently across the, the plate. Again, with confocal microscopy, what you're looking for is branching filaments. Um, sometimes hard to see those because the overlying stroma is, is hazy and this is a deep ulcer. Uh, but you can, it's, it's got pretty good sensitivity and specificity. So we are usually, we're doing this in pretty much any patient that we uh, expect to see fungus. And then once you've diagnosed a fungus, how would you treat it? So medically, surgically, and then the, some of the ancillary things that we've mentioned in the past, and I'll mention those again in a few minutes. Um, topical medications are of two types. You have polyenes, you have azoles. The polyenes work a little bit differently. They bind to ergosterols and make the cell wall permeable. So they make little puncture holes in the fungus and the fungi die. The azoles actually prevent fungus from growing new ergosterol, so you can't grow the fungus. So they work a little bit differently. Though even the natamycin and the amphotericin, which are both polyenes, work very differently. So natamycin works much better for filamentous fungi. 
especially fusarium, whereas amphotericin works a lot better for yeast. The azoles um, are, work globally, so they work for both in most cases. Voriconazole is the one that we use most frequently, uh, but it works really well on aspergillus especially, uh, but it can work for filamentous fungi. It can also work on candida. So as a rule of thumb, what do I normally do for filamentous fungi? I usually use natamycin. I like using amphotericin if you're not sure what it is. And also amphotericin is a little more toxic. It penetrates a little bit better and it prevents the epithelium from healing probably. So maybe that's why it lets things penetrate. So um, amphotericin is a good medication to use if you don't know what you're dealing with. Uh, but otherwise, natamycin and voriconazole work well for filamentous fungi. For aspergillus, you definitely want to use voriconazole and natamycin. And if you're dealing with candida, natamycin doesn't do anything for that. So you want to use amphotericin and voriconazole. Typically, we don't use this as frequently as you do antibacterials. So you wouldn't, you would, and again, you're using it for much longer periods of time. So we usually put them on uh, one medication on the even hours and another one on the odd hours. And that lets them still get some rest and keep this going for the three to four weeks that they need to use it. Um, and then we obviously want to use cycloplegia. Usually they have a lot of inflammation in the anterior chamber and you might treat their fungus and then end up with bad uh, angle closure glaucoma. The MUT studies I will talk about really briefly uh, basically looked at voriconazole versus natamycin for filamentous fungi. They work pretty well, but, not, but for fusarium, which is what we see in, in Florida, and we see in India most of the time, um, the natamycin was significantly better. So they suggested that you don't use boriconazole as a monotherapy. We still can use it with uh, natamycin as a dual therapy for, fung for filamentous fungus. And then MUT2 looked at oral boriconazole in addition to natamycin, and they found that in fusarium it actually did help. So in some cases you might want to use boriconazole, and those are usually the cases where you suspect that the fungus has gone deep and might be in the anterior chamber, or you cannot treat it medically uh, with topical drops. But it does have some pretty significant adverse effects. People can get very vivid hallucinations and things with that, and can also cause liver problems, just like any other antifungal. So be careful with it. Uh, we have been using a lot more anti intercameral antifungals um, recently uh, for patients with no who are non-responsive, who've got an intraocular what we think is an intraocular fungus. So if you see that formed hypopian, you see an endothelial plaque, uh, we tend to treat them with intracameral antibiotics and use the same doses as you do for intrastromal. And I actually love intrastromal injections. I heard about this first when I went to India and Rajesh and uh, Namrata told me about this. And I use this for all my fungal and it's just completely changed my practice and my practice when I do surgery. So I usually use a 32 gauge needle, which is what the, the retina people use for the intravitreal injections. And I use either amphotericin, uh, the intravitreal doses actually of both boriconazole or amphotericin. And I go in about four to five areas around this. I go into normal cornea and make a nice little bleb and you let that bleb gray, uh, grow into the actual infiltrate. So I don't go into the infiltrate, I go around it and raise these blebs all the way around that. And this has caused me to get patients who I would have definitely done PKPs for um, to treat them medically. So it's worked really, really well. So I definitely would suggest that you try that because with fungal ulcers, the big thing is you can do a transplant. And often what you'll see is that the infection will be back in the transplant because you didn't get all of it. So now, but even when I do a transplant, and the other problem is you cannot treat them, if you treat them with steroids after you've done a transplant, they can get, uh, if there's any fungus left at all, they will get recurrence of the fungus. So now what I do is I do a corneal transplant and then I go and inject. The last thing I do after I've removed all the viscoelastic is put intracameral antifungals into the anterior chamber. And then I go around wherever the infiltrate was and I give multiple intrastromal injections as well as in, uh, subconjunctival. And I touch wood, I have had very, very, very few recurrences since I've been doing that, almost none. And so that's been my, my rule of thumb when I do a transplant for, if I do an acute transplant in a fungal ulcer, I will give intracameral and intrastromal to all those patients after the surgery or right after the surgery. Uh, patch grafts work really well for fungal ulcers too, because one of the problems you have with, if you can get away with a patch graft, right? So if the infiltrate is small enough that you can punch it out, and I use a dermal punch for these, 
Um, the nice thing is because you cannot use uh, uh, steroids to prevent rejections afterwards, if you do a really large central graft, these grafts tend to fail. And so they're usually temporary grafts until you can do a second graft. Sometimes they do fine. But if you do a little tiny patch graft, even if it rejects, that's not a problem because there are so few endothelial cells here, the host cornea will repopulate this area and then you don't ever have to worry about redoing that transplant because it heals up really nicely. So I love doing patch grafts because they work well. Again, I'll do the patch grafts and then I'll give intrastromal antifungals all the way around. And that's all I have. I was trying to keep to my time, but uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sonal, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, Can I ask a question, if, if you don't mind, Hassan? Of course. Uh, yes, sir, yes, uh, yes. Do you do the intrastromal injections for uh, bacterial ulcers as well? I have not been. But, um, you know, for, I've, I've rec so recently I've been, th sometimes you see unusual organisms like mycobacteria and things like that, or if they're in a flap, uh, a LASIK flap. Um, I, ha I haven't seen that since I've decided to do that, but in the future I will be doing intrastromals for things like unusual organisms that I would, uh, you know, mycobacteria or in a LASIK flap or in a cataract wound where they're deep ulcers, where it's hard to get them from the topical surface. But usually if the epithelium is breached, then... Then the I bacteria, that, I don't worry about it. Yeah, no. They not, usually not, do uh, really well. Me. And just one comment I would like to add to what you've shown about uh, AC taps. So AC taps are perfect for fungus because they do enter the AC directly. But for bacteria, it's the wrong thing to do. So right. if you are not sure, don't, because you can then introduce the infection inside, and this just for the audience. Uh, the bacterial hypopions are sterile. It's the toxins that have gone into the anterior chamber and caused the hypopion. But in fungus, it is the fungus often. So there's a difference. Very good point. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Very right. Thank you, sir. Just, Thanks. just one point I would like to add here, based on the discussion that we just now had and what Sonal told that, you know, in post LASIK, I would, I would, you know, start thinking of using, I think it, it, will be a good idea to use because in post-classic keratitis, most of the times we have to amputate the flap in order to have a good response. So the basic idea is to have the drug, you know, reach there in sufficient concentration so that it works. So I, I, it will be a good idea to see how well these intrastromal, you know, antibacterials work in cases of post-classic keratitis. Rajesh, I see a, a, a clinical trial coming in your future uh, but but is it not true then that if you give the antibiotics in the interface that is as good as an intrastromal injection and you might be able to do it with a blunt cannula rather than a needle you don't have to go in the depth and, and just because normally as you lift the flap and you wash out and then you treat it with the antibiotics in, in, in the interface i think the thinking with the injection yeah. is that you create a little depot that slowly releases the antibiotics. So yes, you would wash, you know, I would certainly lift the flap, wash it out. But then if yeah. you give a, a depot in there, then it yeah. stays a little bit longer. Yeah. And surprisingly yeah. patients, uh, you know, do not have a, they're pretty cooperative with these. And so you can do it multiple times and, uh, and get, get a, a low dose going all the time and then add the topical to that. Okay, uh, thank you, Sonal. But but uh, uh, what what about the 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 power of injection? Because if we if I try to inject intrastromally, I will find the resistance, so I have to push it. Uh, uh, do you have any problem from this push? If it may go uh, in the anterior chamber, because there is no in, in integrated layers of the cornea. And that's, and that's probably, you know, that is a, certainly something, and that's why we use a 32 gauge needle, which is very thin. So it's unlike, you know, it's obviously more likely to go deep, but if you go in flat, uh, it, you can get into stroma without having to get into get perforating. Now, in a lot of these cases where I'm sure it is fungus and I'm giving them intrastromal, I'm, and that's why going through a part of the eye that's not infected. So I don't inject into the infiltrate. 
I go next to the infiltrate into normal cornea and then let it ooze into the, you know, the bleb to form into the, the infiltrate. And that way, even if it perforates, now I've ended up with an intracameral injection and I don't necessarily have a, a major problem. But it, it's unusual to have that happen. Uh, and again, you, you know, most of us have do, do cataract surgery all the time. We're very used to doing intrastromal in, you know, injections yeah. of BSS. Yeah. 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 And we're used to seeing the, the elevation and the pressure that we feel. And so most of us are pretty good at stopping when we see that bleb forming. Once it gets into the infiltrate, I stop and then go into another place. And that's why not just one big one, multiple little tiny aliquots around the ulcer. Yeah, it's and, and you might you might add over here that you know uh, I, I'm sure I, a lot I, of I, the people will be using a, a, a thirty, um, not a thirty two, but um, thirty gauge needle 30 gauge. or or which is not welded to the syringe. It will be a so make sure you have a lure lock syringe if you're right. not going to use the one like you use for the anti-VEGF or the insulin where the, the needle is actually welded and it just won't shoot out from the tip of your syringe. Very good point. Very good point because they have done that. Yeah, okay. It's very important point based upon the air bubble which we, which we are injecting during the dark surgery. So I think the dual ear has a role in such, in such a situation too. <laughs> Right, sir, because it may it may pass around and go to, into the anterior chamber like the air bubble. So, so we have to be uh, um, and we have to be and um, backgrounded about this this point. Uh, really, Dr. Sunel, you you have shown the the, fun, the fungal infection in its acute phase, and you are keeping all the time the mushroom image on the side. So tell, tell us what. <laughs> Tell us what, what's, what's the relation between the mushroom and the fungal infection, because I have the mushroom in my dinner this night. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but mushrooms, as you know, are fungi. So that's, that's the, the, the connection. So I'm sorry. I didn't mean to ruin your dinner. No, 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 no problem. Uh, uh, yeah. And is the medium you know, where you dissolve your antibiotic? I remember there's paper said it should be in sucrose or in glucose, in glucose for intracameral do you have any medium in which you dissolve them or just the ready-made ones that you get, the injection ones? Uh, so, oops, I'm sorry, yeah. So uh, our pharmacy makes it up for us, but it's a regular media. So they do not, they're not using sucrose. Not for, sucrose, the, not I think for it amphotericin was, at any rate. Yeah, I think it was, uh, the earlier papers were to use glucose. I remember I've only done it once in my life when there were big endothelial plaques and we used, uh, and we read the literature at the time and we dissolved it in glucose and we put it in, but in, that's normal intravenous glucose solution. So that's what was recommended. I think it, uh, so we do it in water. I, it, it's not saline, it's water um, for the for dilution, but not sucrose. Yeah. I don't know, Rajesh, what do you guys use for? We use uh, water or uh, uh, just the normal saline. Yeah. The distillation water, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, uh, I, I want to ask about the uh, the intimate relation between the vegetable injury or the food injury and the fungal keratitis. It's one of the clues uh, during the, the history of the patient, right? Yes, that it's is very true. Yes, so vegetative matter trauma is what we used to be classically taught. Yeah, so, so, if, so I've, if I heard from my patient that there, there was a history of vegetative trauma, I, I have 100% to consider that this infection is fungal. If you're in Florida, probably, or in, in you know, India, but uh, in not Egypt. probably in the temperate climates. In Egypt, too, we have. We, right. we have in Egypt all type, types. It's, it's so. not necessarily always fungal. Even, no. even of the agricultural labors, they have, they develop cantilever keratitis also when you know they get some trauma in the fields and they're not sure about by what they had the trauma and then there is a contamination by the soiled water so you can have uh, cantilever as well and we see a lot of bacillus from soil yeah uh, so not necessary absolutely <clears throat> okay so now we'll, we'll, i think we'll let uh, dr rajesh get on with his talk yeah okay the Rajesh will cover it so we and I will try to, to pick him up before going to sleep, into sleep. I know it's too late in India now. Uh, but I will ask just two questions about the fungal keratitis. What's the, what's the concentration of the intracameral 
uh, drug, a defunct drug you have injected in intracranial? Uh, so I use the same doses as I use intravitreal. Yeah. Um, for amphotericin, I use five micrograms per 0.1 cc. And for voriconazole, we actually use 50 micrograms per 0.1 cc. Okay, perfect. Uh, then what, what about the intrastromal paper soaked with the antifungal or the antibiotic in case of the microbial keratitis? I, uh, the, in the Astris 2018, there was um, a, a, an Indian surgeon showed that about the intrastromal paper like that of the lab to, to be soaked with the antimicrobial, even antifungal and in, implanted into the stroma with the stitch for two weeks. Uh, do you hear? Do you hear about? Did you hear about that? And what's your opinion, Dr. Sonal? First, sorry, uh, I couldn't hear you for a while. Your, your uh, I was, I was, as, I was asking about the intrastromal paper implantation interest of, of a paper intrastromally. This paper is soaked with the antimicrobial or or antifungal, oh. in your case. And, and put in place in the pocket, in the stromal pocket for just two weeks with the stitch and then to be removed again. The, the, I have not done or seen that, Rajesh. Yeah, you don't have to remove it, actually, it dissolves. Uh, so uh, we, we, in our own pharmacy, uh, we, uh, you know, with our uh, you know, pharma consultant has uh, made that. So it acts as a depot. You can uh, create a stroma, intrastomal pocket and place it there, and it dissolves. So it works as a. Uh, I mean, in, because most of the antifungals have poor penetration, so it helps in terms of you know a, a depot wherein you know there's a sustained release and it is quite deep, so it covers up well. And uh, in that preparation, that the uh, uh, in uh, I don't know about the other preparation that you are talking about removing that, but in most of these uh, preparations, the the paper or the 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 material that is used to impregnate the antifungal it dissolves uh, by itself. That is the thing. But then yes. there is one uh, one uh, paper wherein uh, yes uh, I remember now that they had to remove that small uh, yes plant uh, also. That is true. Uh, okay, but you, did, you didn't do one study related to this, and uh, but in that the the material that is being used gets dissolved. Yeah. Right. Okay. But but you yeah. have a, a, a personal experience about this uh, about this way of treatment. Uh, you asking asking me? Yeah. 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 It is actually. Uh, it is good in the sense that uh, you know you can keep it. We we have just created that and we are about to start the project. So uh, we have done it. Uh, it has been seen in uh, the rabbit side, and uh, we have done that part of it. So um, uh, I mean, it would be good to compare this with the topical medication and. Uh, see the aqueous concentration of uh, the uh, the antifungal drug. So, uh, I mean, it is just the initial stage that we are in. So maybe with time we'll be able to know. But the, but the, but the material that, that is being used by our own pharmacy, by the uh, pharma consultant, that material dissolves. So we don't have to remove it. So that is the advantage. Yeah, okay. But actually, I think it, it's more suitable if you... Uh, in, in, in cases of early infection, because you, you may have a good thickness for, for the pocket creation and the implantation. And I, I think the interstromal uh, the, injection sh the, the pocket uh, creation by... is always done in the, in the clear area, in the healthy area. Otherwise, yeah. you won't be able to retain the, the pellet in the, in the area. So it is always created in the healthy area. In the healthy area, so, and then diffusion the to the next no. the neighboring area is. Okay, but, yeah, yeah. But, 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 but you think that the intrastromal uh, uh, injection uh, Sonal uh, told us about uh, is, is, is better? Uh, see, unless we do the study that intrastromal is better or this uh, pellet is better, it's very difficult to say. But uh, intrastromal yeah. injections, they do work, and particularly in fungal keratitis. I, I will completely agree with Professor Dua that, you know, in bacterial, I will never 
give uh, endostromal because it, uh, as was telling that it you know proliferates very fast and then you hardly get time to do all that. But in fungal, many times you see that it's mostly deep and there's hardly any, I mean, many times you don't get even an, an epithelial defect and it, the infiltrates are quite deep. In such scenario, uh, you know, with, a, with an intact epithelium, with poor penetration of the, all the, you know, which is known with all the antifungal uh, drops, eye drops, it would be better to use uh, a depot preparation. It would be better to go deep into the stroma and inject. So in such cases, my preferred treatment will be to go ahead and put an intrastromal. And if it's pretty deep with an endothelial plaque, maybe I will go for intracameral as well. Yeah. Uh, if, if there's no epithelial defect and the infiltrate is uh, totally deep. Because we do get such cases in fungal keratitis wherein we have only deep infiltrate. There's hardly any superficial infiltrate and epithelium is also intact. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, my friend. But actually, the intrastromal is less invasive, less invasive procedure. You can do it even in your clinic. So it's, it's easier and more helpful uh, away from the other, uh, the other part. But uh, to summarize these points, you can inject intrastromally in the cornea with a fungal infection if you are sure about it. But you don't do if you are not sure because if it's bacterial, you may introduce the infection inside the eye. Right. Uh, so uh, 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 before going to the next questions, we will uh, uh, I will ask my dear brother and friend, uh, Dr. Rajesh Sina, to tell about about uh, about the acanthomy bacteritides. Uh, please, sir. And uh, really, I am worried about the rock behind you. It may fall on uh, on your back. I'm worried about you. It, it's it's wonderful background. <laughs> it it was uh, done actually in the, the last visit that we had at Al Azhar University, and I had yeah. gone to the pit. So yeah. thanks to you for you know making me so powerful to lift that rock. You know, it's a, it's a, it's not a rock; it's just a small stone actually. Yeah, it's a ferris. It's a solo ferris. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, I would like to thank you and uh, uh, always great pleasure, you know, having a meeting with uh, Professor Hossam and he's a very dear friend and that too, an honor to, you know, share the same virtual podium with Professor Dua and Professor Sunil. So it's, 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 it's I'm really very pleased and uh, not at all feeling, you know, sleepy, rather I'm very excited even, uh, you know, at uh, one o'clock, I think twelve fifty-six India time at night. So, thank you very much for allowing me to speak on acanthoma keratitis. The this is fortunately not a very common cause uh, amongst all the microbial keratitis. Uh, some of the studies have shown less than one percent. Some of the studies have shown one to two percent of all microbial keratitis, and. Um, the risk factors are mostly contact lens users if you consider the Western literature. And uh, even in India, uh, in the tropical countries, in India also, we, the majority of cases are basically because of uh, the use, or rather I would say abuse of contact lens, misuse of contact lens when you know, contact lenses are not handled properly. A, couple, a few cases I've seen when the patient had slept for four hours using contact lens, came with uh, a couple with pseudomonas keratitis and uh, one with uh, ganthamoeba keratitis. So, so sleeping and swimming with contact lens, all these things are not acceptable and that can have uh, complications like this. Then some people do, uh, you know, clean their contact lenses with the uh, solution that is provided to them, but they don't clean the case with that and they use the uh, homemade saline or they use the tap water. And uh, there are various studies which have shown, I mean, even in UK, Professor Dua must be knowing that initially the studies have been done, the, this, uh, this study was done in UK by Kilrington et al. And there are a couple of other studies also which have shown abundance of amoeba in tap water. 
and uh, that if, if that is there in UK, then it is it can be present anywhere else in um, many other countries. So uh, if somebody uses tap water for cleaning the case, then the, there's risk of amoeba getting attached to the case, and that can lead to you know contamination of the contact lens. And once you place it in the eye, sometimes you rub the eye. Sometimes there is edema in the uh, in the in the cornea because of, you know you have slept. It reduces the local immunity. Sometimes it can get infected. Sometimes there can be abrasion, and that can be you know, get contaminated with the cantamoeba that is there in the contact lens. So all these things are very much possible, and even the orthokeratology, which has been uh, you know uh, told that it has led to uh, you know cantamoeba keratitis in some of the cases. So in all those, uh, uh, I, I can't say all, but most of the studies. Uh, uh, with a canthe in which they have reported a canthe keratitis with orthokeratology, it was tap water that was the culprit that was used to clean the lens of the case. So, so that is something I, that's why I use the word that misuse or abuse of contact lens can lead to a canthe keratitis. And in some in countries uh, wherein uh, you know you can have uh, you know uh, lack of uh, understanding amongst the agricultural labor, which can happen in, in any part of the world, then you can have some trauma and then contamination with brackish water, with the soiled water, and that can lead to a canthamoeba keratitis. So if there is a canthamoeba keratitis, the patient can uh, develop severe pain, which is characteristic of a canthamoeba keratitis. However, there are reports from India with uh, no, uh, with minimal pain in cases of acanthamoeba keratitis, but most of these patients, what I have seen in our, in my experience, it, the immunocompetent patients they do have pain, and those patients who are immunocompromised to some extent, like, like uh, uh, we have some examples of acanthamoeba keratitis, uh, which was which which we found out to have a cantilever keratitis by confo scan, et cetera, and then the patient did not have pain. Then we evaluated systemically and we found that the patient was diabetic. So in diabetes, in HIV patients, uh, we, can, we may have painless cantilever keratitis or, or, or minimal pain uh, associated with cantilever keratitis. And many times we diagnose cantilever keratitis when the person uh, has not been found to be uh, showing any uh, my, uh, microorganism like any bacteria or viral or fungus, and then we investigate for acanthamoeba, and then we find it. Because acanthamoeba is not very common, that's why it is not the first thing that people investigate for. Then, as far as symptom is concerned, most of the patients have severe pain. As I said, they can have redness, they can have photophobia, blurring of vision. And uh, as far as the uh, signs and examination is concerned, it varies with the time of diagnosis. Now, if you are lucky and you are seeing a case in the initial phase, you may get some uh, you know, epithelial irregularity, which can be punctate, which can be linear. You can have pseudodendritiform appearance. Why I said pseudodendritiform? Because it gives an appearance of a herpetic keratitis, but the the uh, dendrites they don't have the terminal bulbs they are they have tapering ends and uh, that that is a sign of a pseudodendritiform keratitis then after that if you are lucky enough then you can get to see this uh, perineural infiltrate and the radial keratoneuritis because uh, most of the times what we find in our setup or wherever if you are working in a tertiary care setup the patients are referred when they don't respond and then you don't get to see these or you don't get to see these uh, patchy infiltrates or multifocal infiltrates. Rather, you get to see a ring infiltrate, which is partly you know, causing stromal melting, stromal lysis. Sometimes you can have perforation as well, but it is not that fast growing. You know, a ring infiltrate causing a very fast perforation will clinically give you an idea that probably we are dealing with a pseudomonas keratitis. But a ring infiltrate, which is there you know, as a ring for a long period and perforating at a later date, at a, after a long interval, that may have a keratitis. So that is you know, based on the clinical 
uh, uh, you know, suspicion, one can think in those lines. Then uh, this is what uh, is I was meaning by uh, ring infiltrate, as I had shown in the picture, and this is the small video clip. And uh, most of these cases are slow in progression. The period of remission also is quite long. It takes a lot of time. And if, if you know, there are a lot of cases which don't have, they don't show corneal neovascularization. But if there is scleritis, you can have a neovascularization. You can have, uh, you know, these vessels quite prominent in the limbus area. You can have limbitis, you can have scleritis. And this is a case post PRK, acanthiobacteritis. The patient, this was a 20 year old girl who, 20, 21 year old girl who underwent PRK and uh, then bandage contact lens was put and three days later she developed keratitis. And then uh, she did not respond to the treatment what was given and then she was referred to me and then after that she was managed here. So you can see here, you know, in most of these cases we have large epithelial defect, we have infiltrate and then we do, in this case, the, the, the girl had scleritis and this scleritis was typically uh, showing a, 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 a enlarging kind of, uh, you know, a sort of a fleeting kind of wherein the nodule appeared and disappeared with a trophy of the sclera in that region. And then there was adjacent nodule ad, adjacent to the atrophic area. And this is how it happened. And then we had a ring of atrophy all around with, this, with the, with the corridor show. So you can have a scleritis like that. And as far as the microbiological diagnosis is concerned, you have to do corneal scraping. But if it's an early case, you can have a superficial scraping and you can get the organism. But if it's a long standing, then the organism, the amoeba penetrates deep. So you have to, you know, take a deep scraping. And then uh, if it is not working, then in that case, as Professor Dua was mentioning, we have to do corneal biopsy. And of course, confocal microscopy, I'm quite impressed in cases of acanthiobacteritis, confocal microscopy helps quite a lot in many cases. And of course, PCR is something which is there to diagnose. So staining can be done, the cyst stained very well with calcofluor white, with pass. And then as far as culture is concerned, it is cultured on non-nutrient agar with live or killed gram-negative bacilli like E. coli. So what happens that these, uh, these acanthia, but they feed on these E. coli. So, so they show typical trails or the tracks uh, in the, in the uh, culture plate. Now, in, in cases of presence of polymorphs or macrophages also, you can have some uh, trails or tracks. But on a serial transfer, these polymorphs or macrophages, they will die. So a confirmatory culture will be on a serial transfer. If you do a serial transfer, again, if you see these tracks or trails, then this means that this is a canthamoeba on culture. And Confoscan, as I said, is quite useful in cases of canthamoeba keratitis. And uh, uh, you can see these inflamed nerves uh, in uh, in these cases, as you can see here, and then as you uh, move further, you can see double wall cysts present in the in the in the eye. You can see double wall cysts present, and and then as you move further in the basal epithelium, you can see the uh, the refractile trophozoite. So so Confoscan helps in some of the cases wherein you know, and you can do it immediately. You can get uh, like the patient was referred, and as the last case I, I was showing, that patient had shown double wall cyst on Confoscan. So, so that is quite useful. And PCR is something which is you know, coming up fast and it has, you know, now it is quite established in terms of uh, you know, uh, getting the amplification of the DNA and uh, diagnosing uh, microbiology. As far as treatment is concerned, a combination therapy is something which is preferred. Uh, uh, some people have combined uh, the two bigonides, uh, PHMB with chlorhexidine. We prefer com combination of uh, uh, bigonide with diamidine. And in many countries, diamidine is not available. So that is perhaps one of the reasons why people combine the two uh, bigonides. But we prefer 
combining bigonide with diamidine and uh, there are some places wherein diamidine is available and uh, amongst the bigonide we use either phmb 0.02% of chlorhexidine both are effective but both are epithelotoxic however uh, in studies people have seen that chlorhexidine is less epithelotoxic than phmb to start with, we give the therapy one hourly for 48 to 72 hours and then subsequently we reduce it. The response typically we expect, uh, you know, the initial response may be at the end of one week, but it takes a little longer time to get a significant response. And it takes about at least four to six weeks time to actually see the response in these cases. And many times in three months, Time it responds completely, four months time it responds completely. And even if there is a clinical response, it is advisable to use bigonides twice a day or thrice a day. <clears throat> Once there's a response, you have to combine it with the lubricant because uh, it is epithelotoxic. But it should be continued for the next six months because even one amoeba present in the cornea can cause a recurrence, can, can cause a further proliferation and uh, deterioration of the uh, keratitis. Systemic therapy with oral voriconazole has been found to be effective in uh, various studies. And we also prefer, if it's a proven case, we do give systemic voriconazole. Miltifosin is uh, an anti leishmania drug, which is you know, coming up fast. People I have done animal study. A couple of human studies have also been done. There are a couple of case reports. They have used systemic miltifosin, 2.5 milligram per kg per day for 28 days. And topical application has also been used. And in one of the, in one of the Indian studies also, they have used with good uh, effect in cases of recalcitrant uh, acanthamibacritis. So miltifosin is, this is by Bagga et al. There, that was done. And they have found out that the results are good. I personally don't have a, a personal you know, experience of uh, topical or systemic mitoposin because it is not that freely available. Now it has been made available. So uh, yes, with time, we will have more experience about the mitoposin in the campaign about keratitis. As far as steroid is concerned, if there is just a keratitis, then we would not like to give steroid because uh, the role is a bit controversial in that. But if there is inflammation in the eye, and initially we used to feel that it is the viral keratitis that causes a quite significant anterior chamber reaction. And so if there was a presence of anterior chamber reaction, we used to think in those lines. But off late, we have seen that in Canthamoeba also, a lot of cases, they do have severe anterior chamber reaction. So in such cases, under cover of bigonides, we should give steroid. Uh, in cases of limbitis or scleritis, we have to give steroid and, uh, and in order to take care of the inflammation. Now, as in this case and in a couple of other cases wherein we had scleritis, we have used systemic steroid and it works quite well. We can give a pulse steroid of one gram methylprednisolone for three days as well. And it has been shown in studies also that it works. Uh, in a couple of cases, we had th this did not work that well, and we had to go for mycophenolate. Uh, I don't have a personal experience with cyclosporine, but I have used mycophenolate in most of the cases wherein we, uh, I had severe scleritis. And uh, and with the you know advice of the rheumatologist, uh, we started with 500 milligram twice a day, then increased to one gram twice a day, and then increased to 1.5 gram twice a day. And if you have started it, you have to use it on a long term, something like maybe six weeks or eight weeks or even more than that. So by eight to 10 weeks is the usual time wherein you have to give it. And uh, as far as supportive therapy is concerned, we do give cyclopegic anti glaucoma medications uh, in most of the cases of keratitis. Lubricants only once it has resolved and many times we do get large epithelial defect in a keratitis. And since the drug also is epithelial toxic, so the epithelial healing is delayed, so we may have to give lubricant. A, a specific word on pain relief I would like to give because I have seen a couple of patients who have not responded even with systemic NSAIDs and even with opioids. 
and in these cases in one case i had to give a lignocaine patch and in two cases i had to give amitriptylin patch because that is a uh, amitriptylin is good for neuropathic pain and i uh, i i use this uh, amitriptylin patch and then the patient got relief of pain, from pain so you have to think of the symptom of the patient as well apart from the you know treating the you know my uh, no apart from killing the microorganism you have to think about the symptom because some of the patients which included one of uh, this patient also this lady who had a acanthoma pancreatitis following prk she had severe pain and if i remember correctly i had to use amitriptylin patch in that lady so in two cases i have used amitriptylin patch and one lignocaine patch and then in a few i have used opioids and some of the cases they respond well with nsaids so you have to be very open in terms of your pain relief so that the patient doesn't uh, you know lose faith in you then cxl uh, is good for bacterial keratitis that is what most of the literature now states but for fungal for other keratitis it is not very good but there are a couple of reports which have shown that cxl works well so uh, this is just to complete but uh, at this point of time uh, we cannot say that it, it, it can be considered as an established modality for a cancer of keratitis and definitely not for fungal and phototherapeutic keratectomy again a couple of case reports are there which have shown that uh, there were some uh, positive results but still it is very much in infancy and we cannot say that it is an established modality uh if nothing is working and the and the cornea has perforated then we have to do a therapeutic graft the risk of recurrence is very high so if we do a therapeutic graft in case of acanthoma pancreatitis we have to give a uh, topical uh, uh, bigonide for a long period something like you know 4 to 5 months or 6 months time so that there's no recurrence in the graft because the recurrence is very high in cases of acanthoma pancreatitis when you do a therapeutic graft. so for 5 to 6 months time we have to give uh, bigonides for prophylaxis and in cases where there is no perforation but it is a long standing non responding and uh, non healing keratitis dal can be considered as a good option and uh, uh, there are a couple of studies which have shown good outcome of dal in acanthoma pancreatitis so so uh, the outcomes depend on the severity of the case the outcomes depend on uh, you know each case what exactly is the severity how much is the involvement what depth it is involving uh, in what stage it is because if we are doing a dalk in case of uh, acanthoma pancreatitis it is always advisable if it's a non responding then go ahead and keep you know uh, uh, giving the topical medication as long as possible so that you can reduce the infective load but then you have to be careful also that you know if it's deteriorating then don't allow it to extend peripherally too much if it extends peripherally quite a lot then in that case it will be difficult to salvage and even if you do a therapeutic graft if it's limbus to limbus involvement and perforated or it's very deep in that case the risk of recurrence again is quite high and the risk of failure of the graft is also high so all these things we have to judge depending upon the case and uh, the management will vary uh, depending upon uh, the presentation of each case thank you very much once again for uh, Allowing me to present on the panel. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Rajesh, for this uh, uh, wonderful uh, presentation, which lighted uh, our minds and opens a new uh, new aspects about the cancerous Because we have a memory about the cancerous that it's related to the contact lens readers. So I was asking Sonal about uh, the agriculture uh, trauma. Uh, it's 100% fungal, and both of you said that it's it may be a cancer amoeba, well, uh, as well. So more often it can be fungal, but it can be a cancer amoeba. Yeah, okay, but we have to consider this this uh, uh, very important point not to uh, to go uh, in, in, into the way of uh, the fungal keratites and uh, forgetting the cancer amoeba as a differential diagnosis. Because the you know the fungal keratitis may take a time for response, and we may wait for uh, for for that. 
suspecting that there's some persistence at this at the start of the therapy. So I will uh, be, before going to the questions about the acanthamoebicrotides, I will ask uh, uh, Sonal a question um, before uh, fading out about the, the fortified antibiotics. Uh, sorry, I read the, fort the fortified eye drops in treatment of fungal keratides. And the same question for uh, Dr. Rajesh, but after your answer, the, uh, the fluconazole, we have a solution, a vi vial for injection. Yeah? C can we do it? Can you, so, uh, can you take are it? Are you talking about for, uh, compound, compounding medications for... Right, so natamycin 5% is available commercially, but all the other medications have to be compounded. Uh, so typically, we will use um, amphotericin, uh, which is 1.5 micrograms per point, so 15 micrograms per point per, per, per ml. And then we use uh, voriconazole 1%, and that's just the voriconazole vial. And you yeah. draw it up from that, and you can use that. Yeah, okay. Um, so that works pretty well. I'm asking about the fluconazole, the vial solution. Oh, fluconazole. Yeah, yeah. We okay. don't typically make fluconazole um, eye drops, but Rajesh might be uh, more familiar with that. Uh, no, uh, we we don't use fluconazole uh, eye drops. We either use natamycin or we use voriconazole. Yeah. Uh, uh, systemically, we we do give uh, you know voriconazole, and if the patient cannot afford, we do give ketoconazole. So. Uh, um, let, 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 let me say that we, for a long time, we, we didn't have uh, a natamycin here in Egypt. So I, I have seen many surgeons, many corneal, many corneal consultants, uh, they, they were using the fluconazole solution um, as such without any dilution in the eye dripper and used as eye drop four times per day for one week at least and then tuber it. Uh, you didn't use that. You, you didn't. We don't typically use fluconazole. Yeah. So although use... I have used myconazole uh, sometimes, co compounded for certain medicate, uh, certain fungal scleritis that wasn't responsive to amphotericin, or and we, at that point we didn't have voriconazole. But since voriconazole has become available, we have been pretty much using voriconazole instead of myconazole or um, fluconazole. Orally, we'll use. Uh, fluconazole, but not yeah. topical. For, yeah. for, for a little time. I use only fluconazole, but not topically. Yeah, okay. Uh, do you. Can do I ask Rajesh a question about. Oh, actually, Rajesh was going to. Uh, a question about uh, topical non steroidals for acanthamoeba. There were yeah. some reports that not, topical non steroidals might be acanthamoeba lytic or beneficial. Do you use uh. those? Um, I will not prefer using topical NSAIDs in cases wherein we have uh, any, you know, epithelial defect because topical NSAIDs have also been uh, known to cause uh, melting. Oh, right. So, yes. uh, and... Uh, there were a couple of reports that came out that said that they yeah. might be um, synergistic with the anti-amoebics. I think they are stromalytic more than acanthamoebalytic. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Really, 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 <laughs> okay. really it is. Really it is. So, so we are fighting for that to, to prevent the, the uh, topical anesthetics. I just want to make a, a, if you don't mind, a couple of comments, you know, for the, for the, for yeah, the sure. people sure, who sir. are in common sure, practice, sir. general practice, that the commonest misdiagnosis of acanthamoeba is either iritis or virus. And if you see anything that looks not your usual virus infection, then think of acanthamoeba. The pseudodendrites, as Rajesh explained, don't have the bulbar termination and the taper. And in a, in a study, we found that, that those are the commonest misdiagnoses. In the, in the early stages, it is purely epithelial and it is best responsive to treatment then. Just debridement of the epithelium is very loose, it comes off, and then you give your, um, your drugs, the combination as described is very useful. If the delay is more than three weeks from diagnosis, then it's very difficult to treat. And the prognosis significantly worse if the treatment is started three weeks or later after diagnosis. 
and a very good point I, I want to uh, concur with. And I told you about that study on coronary vascularization in the BJ we published a few years ago. We found that the, the least uh, inducer of vascularization was acanthamoeba. We had 160 plus cases of vascularization and we looked at in great detail. And the commonest cause of vascularization was herpetic eye disease. The least common was acanthamoeba. And what was very interesting also was that the commonest cause of lipid keratopathy with vessels are with vessels associated with herpes disease, more than with bacterial or with fungal. So some uh, histological differences, uh, which we don't appreciate why is lipid is more common with viral, but that came out quite prominently in that study of ours. Okay, perfect note, sir. Uh, Dr. Rajesh? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> what about the, the polymyxidine and the neomycin antibiotics in, in cases of the acanthamoeba keratitis if we don't have the bigonides? Uh, see, if you don't have bigonide, if you don't have propomidine, well, then I mean, the options are quite less. But, uh, uh, but I think bigonide should be available because it is many times used as a swimming pool disinfectant. Yeah, but and for for, so, for for some reasons we may we may uh, take a time to get it for the patients. So I can. I you can know what you do is you you ask mm -hmm. Zeneca Biocide is a company. Ask any of your people who run swimming pools. That's how yeah. I started. Yeah. Uh, and they will give you a, a bottle that big yeah. and you only need 0 0.02 but that will last you for, yeah. for a lifetime but yeah. you have to that is 20 percent yeah. but you then take it and make it yourself uh, yeah. it is it's got some dyes in it which are not ideal but it's better than nothing uh, and not to forget you know your your broline which is uh, yeah, broline, yes. quite yeah. quite yeah. commonly is also pretty good uh, yeah. And I agree with you. I never use chlorhexidine or, or PHMB together. But what I have found is that you get patients which are refractory to one but respond to the other. And I found it both ways. Yeah. So that is useful. And then John Dart is now doing a study and they're using higher concentrations of uh, PHMB. And it's like 0.06%. So three yes. times more to get much more rapid resolution. But they are extremely toxic. And uh, Rajesh has repeated that point a few times. Remember, these are preservatives, and we have heard tons of literature on preservative toxicities, not just benzylconium, but even PHMB and chlorhexidine. And what I have found, and I'll see if either of you, you know, Sonal or Rajesh can corroborate that, that in the course of treatment of patients with acanthamoeba, you know, three, four weeks down the line, five weeks, there's suddenly a intumescent cataract high pressure, shallow and yes. And I think that's, it's this, these drugs that you're putting in is now epithelial toxic to the lens epithelium. And we are inducing uh, that with our medication. It's not the acanthamoeba. We, we tend to blame it on the acanthamoeba. Uh, and that's what we pay the price for trying to treat uh, with, with these drugs. That's very interesting, but that's very true. You always yeah, see these yeah. cataracts. I was just telling my residents yeah. this the other day that for some reason these acanthamoeba patients always get a cataract. But that makes sense. That's yeah. great. So long back when we were residents, we used to think that you know inflammation or DHMA reaction is more often seen in viral. But uh, you know, uh, of late, we, we, we saw that there were many acanthamoeba cases, keratitis cases, wherein the inflammation was quite severe. So that was one. This, the other thing, as you said, the cataract, was uh, seen in a few cases and we also have seen pers uh, you know uh, persistently dilated pupil in these cases same thing of same th you're right and that happens yeah. with the cataract coincides with that and that's the same reason the toxicity now, i want to ask you a question again this is from your experience even your person tell me have you ever seen a hypopion with a pure viral infection simplex H hypopion uh, with, with what, sir? Sorry? With a pure virus infection, herpes yeah. simplex keratitis. No. Uh, I'm not talking about never. endophthalmitis with the keratitis. With the never. bacteria, we see it, and with the, uh, you know, the endotoxin producing, the to toxin producing bacteria, we see it a lot <laughs> rapidly, a lot yeah. of AC activity, but I have never seen a hypopion. So even 
hypopionus extreme end of AC reaction. Yeah. You see it with a cantilever much more. Yeah. So, you know, that, that somebody says that you get more reaction with virus is not, not entirely true. You get more reaction with a cantilever and bacteria yeah. than with virus. Okay, uh, I have never seen. But really. they say that if there is a herpes uh, iritis, then in that case it can have a uh, 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 bloody hypopion or, or yeah, blood uh, hemorrhagic, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but, okay. But that thing is zoster. Zoster can cause that. But it is be a, if it is an exception, it would prove the rule because it's not as common as or not. Yeah, I have never absolutely. seen one. Very with mixed infections, yes, you will see it with mixed, yeah. but not with pure virus. Right. No, you'll yeah. see chiratic precipitates, and the anterior chamber will be quiet. So, yeah. yes. very true. So, Dr. Rajesh, if you if you have a cantilever keratitis, you you have to have a severe pain. Uh, ex except in the, the uncontrolled diabetic patients, right, with the peripheral neuropathy, right? Uh, it's one yeah, of whenever the, there is immune immune compromise, then uh, yeah. But here's a question for you, Rajesh. Um, uh, you can see that in diabetic diabetic patients, the the nerves are are dulled. So diabetic neuropathy now peripheral diabetic neuropathy. We're talking about fingers and toes. You can diagnose from cornea because you see the neuropathic changes or the neuroatrophic changes in the cornea very early, even before they start getting in the fingers and toes. And that can be why, you know, the pain is less. But for immunocompromised patients, I don't see why they should have less pain. Now, the question again to you, which I honestly don't know the answer to is, with scleritis, there is severe pain. Yeah. And one would attribute that to inflammation. But is the scleritis not due to the acanthamoeba as well? Because all the treatment regimes that you described and others have described all over in the literature for scleritis is immunosuppression. It's steroids or mycophenolate or cyclosporine. But what about the amoeba which are in the sclera? Because if they are in the nerves and the nerves are going into the sclera or they're coming you know, from the, the perilimbal plexus into the, into the limbus, some of these nerves will carry the acanthamoeba into the sclera. So why aren't we treating the amoeba in the sclera with other drugs? We could know that if you give them only immunosuppressive, you're going to make the amoeba infection worse. That's true. So why do we treat scleritis with more immunosuppression and not with more anti-acanthamoeba? Um, that is that is very true. The point is that people have not been able to demonstrate any, uh, you know, thickening of nerves in the sclera, and perhaps that is the reason why they have uh, uh, not uh, compared like uh, the what we find in cornea. They don't attribute the same thing in the sclera. Perhaps that's the reason, and they have also attributed to the uh, dead cell walls. Uh, of the acanthamoeba to be inciting the inflammatory reaction, causing uh, uh, scleritis and limbitis and causing pain. So uh, everything in literature attributes it to uh, immune mediated, uh, attributes to the inflammatory. But that is one thing that one may think that uh, probably if acanthamoeba can cause, uh, uh, you know, uh, radial perineuritis in the cornea, it can also cause a cantilever per se, can cause inflammation of the nerves and can cause uh, um, scleritis. Yeah. And that can be the cause of pain. But having said that, uh, in any case, we are giving anti cantilever treatment in that patient. Like the, 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 the drugs Drops. are going to be caldesic. They are going, getting absorbed and going into the sclera as well. I don't know about the penetration into the sclera, but uh, still the drugs are there, available. And with immune suppression, uh, with, with, with the mycophenolate or with the steroid, they have seen that it has responded. However, having said that, once again, if we give steroid in an active uh, infection also, a cantilever keratitis also, there will be uh, reduction in pain and reduction in symptoms because the inflammatory part will get suppressed. So that is very true. I agree with you that maybe there is some element of acanthamoeba directly causing nerve inflammation and causing uh, pain uh, due to scleritis.
but but there's no evidence actually till date so 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 i think then the answer is that the scleritis is purely inflammatory not infective whereas the keratitis is a combination of inflammation and infection yeah. and and, that, and we know that scleritis from whatever cause is usually extremely painful and and, and that's but, why but we don't know sir <laughs> that whether the scleritis is purely inflammatory or it is a combination of infection and inflammation but but that's why i'm asking you the question that if it is a combination then it happened despite our anti inflammatory treatment and we up our anti inflammatory treatment and immunosuppressive treatment but we don't have any way of upping our anti acanthamoeba treatment to treat scleritis yeah another point which is in favor of the inflammatory component having more role in causing scleritis is that most of these cases have scleritis after a certain period of treatment with anti acanthamoeba drugs so it, it doesn't happen immediately you know along with the keratitis it happens only when the patient has been treated with anti acanthamoeba uh, drugs so probably you know the drugs have caused some destruction of the acanthamoeba uh, and uh, i mean that, that's the explanation that has been given that probably the drug has caused some destruction the cell walls and um, uh, other inflammatory component are there and that is causing inflammation so that is this is one evidence which suggests that it it is not infective purely it it has inflammatory component which is more uh, greater role in causing scleritis but this again does not rule that there is no infective uh, role yeah yeah actually actually uh, uh, the perineural neurites uh, may be the first cause of pain at the start of the disease and then the complication and uh, and the propagation of the disease as an inflammatory response and as an immune reaction to the infection itself with the lymphites and the sclerites may increase the the pain more and more so we may need the uh, in, in invention of the uh, so uh, advention of the uh, systemic drugs to compete for this uh, aggressive and progressive pain with with inflammation itself uh but actually the 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 there um there are a lot of cases of acanthamoeba keratitis with a confined infection to the cornea without propagation or ex yeah. extension to the peripheral parts so the the pain is tolerable it it may be severe at the start before getting the signs uh driving us towards towards the acanthamoeba i found it in 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 uh in a girl Uh, who was fourteen uh, years, fourteen uh, years old with a contact lens, with a history of recent history of contact lens. Actually, the, this contact lens was not her, her contact lens. Uh, she uh, she borrowed it from her friend, so she got an infection, and starts with a severe pain, like. Like that of the of the uh, uh, the corneal foreign body, the metallic corneal foreign body. When I examined the cornea, I found just a, a very faint, very faint uh, infiltration without epithelial defect. So I didn't get the diagnosis uh, uh, clinically at the, uh, at this um, at this time, but I put it the mind in in my mind the contact lens wearing. So I started with neomycin and the polymyxidine until I get the proline, which is somewhat expensive and not available at the time uh, around. So within within two days, I found that this is uh, I found that the cornea uh, got a ring like that of the ring ulcer, with, with with a whitening, with opacification and the severe infiltration. But the pain is is less than the first day. It's not. It was not increasing. I, I didn't get any analgesic, either topical or systemic. So it may be related at the at the start of the disease to the perineural neurites, which is um, like that. The the patient having after PRK, there is exposure of the neurosensory endings, so there is severe pain. So that it may be related to it at the start. This is my opinion. Well, Yeah. See, actually, the initial pain is basically because of the nerve inflammation, and once there is ring infiltrate, then many times what happens is that the nerve is destroyed. 
so the yeah. pain is not that much as it was earlier yeah okay and but the, but, but the let pain me that develops later yeah yeah, yeah let, let me say that i'm 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 talking and asking repeatedly about these points because it may be uh, these these points may be thought as a rules so i want to uh, to put um uh, I, I i want to put them as as a considerable points not a fixed points uh, so i was talking about the fungal keratites with the vegetative trauma yeah yeah it's 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 a common but it's not 100% uh, confirmed diagnosis so the pain with the canthamoeba keratites if if uh, so, some of my colleagues ask, ask me about uh, or refer the case for uh, for, for me uh, with a corneal uh, uh, ulceration or the corneal infection w one of the one of the lines which uh, which may be written at the start there is no pain so there is no acanthamoeba so so um, i i want to clarify this point it's not mandatory to, to be with contact lens history. It's not a mandatory to find a severe pain to put or to exclude the acanthamoeba keratides. Am I right, my dear professors? Yeah. Yeah. True. yeah, you're absolutely right. In fact, the first case of acanthamoeba was diagnosed in a non-contact lens wearer. So that association with contact lens is common, but not um, exclusive. Yeah. And if you get a, can, a contact lens related keratitis, think of pseudomonas before you think of any, anything else. So that's very common. And that can also give you some radial keratinuritis, so much red, and it can also give you a ring abscess. So mm -hmm. as, uh, uh, as we've seen, so you, you've got to be wary of that. And, and, and like that, you know, we have seen, all of us have seen that you get a cancer patients where pain is not a prominent feature. Although the books will say pain disproportionate to the clinical findings is a feature. Yes, if there's radial keratinuritis, you do get pretty bad pain. And yeah. the interesting thing also, which we have seen in our in vitro model, we made a model where we injected a canthamoeba culture into the stroma and look at the histology. So there's no host immune response here. The cornea is a culture, organ culture model. The acanthamoeba actually feed on the keratocytes. Interest how beautifully you can see half eaten keratocytes with trophozoites around them. And if you have no keratocytes, so it's not apoptosis only or necrosis, you're seeing actually them being the, the food of the acanthamoeba. And that stroma, which has very poor keratocytes, or will probably not produce enough VEGF to cause vascularization. That was our theory, uh, why we see be less vessels with the canthamoeba. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. What, what, what about the pain in 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 the, in the fungal uh, keratitis? So no. Um, so fungal keratitis too. The patients will have a lot of photophobia, and again, like you know, both of the Dr. Dua and Dr. Sinad mentioned that you can have intact epithelium, so they don't have that <laughs> foreign body sensation quite as much as you would with the other bacterial ulcers but they will be pretty photophobic. And actually, if you look at their iris, um, you'll see that there's a lot of inflammation in the anterior chamber, and you can see engorged iris, almost like neovascularization. And that's, a, an, again, kind of a, a key feature that makes you start thinking, is there fungus going on? Because it does cause quite a bit of inflammation. So they do complain of photophobia quite a bit uh, and pain, uh, but it is a painful disease, just like any other ulcer, of course. Okay, and Petra, but... If you want to know a bit more about pain in the cornea, I mean, you know, Anna Gallo has uh, uh, published a lot, but three right. papers. One we published recently on neurotrophic keratopathy in progressive and retina eye research, and one in uh, the same journal on corneal nerves and health and disease. But a very important paper in the BGO, I think just last year, on um, corneal pain without stain. And these patients have got neuromas in the stroma. There are different types of neuromas. You have lateral neuromas, stump neuromas, and fusiform neuromas. They have absolutely no history at all, no clinical sign that you can see, but they are in so much pain that they are suicidal. And they have these neuromas in the cornea. And what we do there is we, we do the anesthesia test, 
So if you put a drop of anesthetic agent and the pain disappears, and you can do that in each eye, then you know it's peripheral pain as against central pain. So most corneal pain then gets embedded in the brain over time and the anesthetic doesn't help. Then you know that they need something more, more uh, systemically acting like the amitriptyline um, Rajesh mentioned. Uh, so, and you can get um, a dissociation between corneal features and conjunctival features. So corneal may be completely anesthetic, but the conjunctiva is, so that's a sign of a peripheral pathology uh, in, in this sort of situation. So there's a lot about corneal nerves, which we didn't know before because you couldn't see them. And uh, we um, have also noticed that particularly after any kind of surgery, refractive surgery and after corneal transplant surgery, you get aberrant regeneration or hyper regeneration of nerves. And you will see coils and bullous keratopathy is a common feature. Keratoconus, it's amazing how thick and how many nerves you have coiled in the area of the cone. So there is a huge amount of nerve pathology going on in all diseases of the cornea, which we are learning about more. And I have several lectures on corneal nerves, the forgotten factor in corneal health and disease. We're learning more and more, and we will learn more about pain. Uh, you know, like Rajesh was mentioned, neuropathic pain versus nociceptive pain versus other kinds of pain. So it is uh, a whole, whole big minefield. Very interesting. Okay, great, sir. Thank you. But the corneal pain without a stain is a rhyme. I think I'll words. have to leave. Yeah, it's um, rhyming it's... words, yeah. Uh, okay, we, we have just uh, uh, yeah, the last topic about the viral keratites. Uh, I will I will run over very quickly upon it. Uh, I think there is nothing to say after what uh, my professors said about the corneal infection, but I will take it just five minutes to show something about the viral keratites. Starting from, I think you 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 can see my screen now. Uh, starting from the uh, the civilization and the clouds and the sun. Where, when there is a sun. Uh, the, the, the clouds of the, uh, the sun of the knowledge will remove the clouds of the confusion because the microbial keratites is one of the, conf the very confusing topics. So am um, I thanking again to my dear uh, professors and guest speakers? I have uh, really, I have a good memories and, uh, and good, good time. I, I spend good times with, with all of them, with Professor Doa and Eskris and with Professor Sonal in Chennai, and also with Rajesh both in India and in my university, uh, Al Azhar University, when he came and joined us there. Uh, so the viral keratites, the commonest cause of the infective keratites in the developed countries, the, the, the common viruses is the herpes simplex virus, type one and type two, and type one is more in the ocular infection than type two, which may be transmitted by the genital infection during delivery or in the early life. Also the varicella zoster in case of herpes zoster of thalamicus, where the eye or the cornea is included with the, with the pathognomonic sign, which is the infection or affection of the tip of the nose. Also, the adenoviral keratitis, the thigeson, and finally, the COVID, if it's included as one of the keratoconjunctivites, could be a cause. Uh, this is a diagram showing the, the, the cycle of the hepatitis, uh, herpes simplex virus uh, from the trigeminal ganglion uh, from uh, at the primary infection, then go and defraud from uh, the trigeminal ganglion to the cornea and to the other parts of the ophthalmic branch. It's DNA virus. Humans are the only natural reservoir. The ocular infection occurs as primary or recurrent uh, episodes. Also, the epithelial keratites is related mainly to the direct invasion and the effect of the virus itself. Uh, and so the herpetic keratites is called commonly as epithelial keratites because it's more, uh, as, as more, uh, it's more presented as, uh, epithel as an epithelial. Uh, defects and the epithelial infl inflammation and uh, uh, affection more than the stromal, but the stromal comorbidity is related to 
the CD4 and T cell destruction as an immune response to the inflammation. Also, I will uh, skip this uh, table showing that the, the combined incidence of epithelial and stromocrotitis is in France and the United States and developed nations with different percentages, but it's commonly epithelial. The global incidence of hebrosemic uh, securitites is roughly around this number, but uh, at the monoc mon monocular visual imp 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 impairment or blinds each year, it's uh, responsible for uh, about around 40,000 of them. As I said, it's epithelial keratitis more than others, so may may uh, may uh, may be like the the figure eight, the figure number A, uh, as the line branching uh, dendrites, and so it's called also the dendritic ulcer. But may start at the punctate epithelial erosion, which is persistent superficial keratopathy. May and may pass to the geographical ulcer in the untreated or the uh, improperly or wrongly treated or in the immunocompromised patients. So the herpetic keratitis may be congenital or neonatal, like such fi uh, figures showing the, the neonatal infection, a congenital one. As microdendrites or the persistence of official keratitis or serpiginous epithelial defects. Uh, so the treatment will be in, in, uh, in the first days or in the incubator, like the topical and the systemic acyclovir ointmenter 3% or intravenous injection of acyclovir 2 grams per day divided upon eight hourly dose for two weeks. What, what about the primary ocular infection, the recurrent ocular infection? The, the cellular and humoral immunity may differentiate both if it's primary or recurrent. If it's recurrent, the, the, the subject will have cellular and humoral immunity against the virus itself with the typical and atypical presentations in the form of blepharic conjunctivitis, <coughs> episcularitis, scurites, or the corneal disease. Uh, the corneal disease may be epithelial, stromal, or DC form or endothelites, and going back to the iris and the trabecular meshwick to, to cause the iridocyclites and trabeculites. Uh, the clinical course and science, well, I will summarize it in just two words. Every case with punctate, persistent punctate bacterial erosion, I think it should be considered as a varicarotis if not responding to the treatment especially if they pass to the linear branching particles with a fluorescein stain, which, which stains the bed and the rose spangle stain, which stains the bulbs and the, the virus laden cells. The marginal and limbal disease are more symptomatic because it's, uh, uh, it's approaching the, the sclera and the limbus too, as, we may, as Dr. Rajesh and Dr. Dover mentioned about the uh, extension of the disease. Then what about the corneal sensation? If there is, a corneal sensation, a good corneal sensation, you may think about the, uh, the viral keratitis. But one of the close signs of the, of the viral keratitis, especially the herpetic one, is the decreased corneal sensation. It may present in different uh, pictures, like the amipoid ulcer. So in such a case, you, you may be conflicted about if it is herpes simplex virus or acanthamoeba, and it's, it has been shown. Uh, uh, what, what about the sequelae of the epithelial keratitis? Maybe with epithelial defects, just punctates, or persistent or recurrent coronal erosions, or persistent epithelial defects, uh, amipoid or geographical ulcer. The stromal keratitis accounts 2% of the primary infection, or and about 20% of the recurrent cases. Uh, and hence, that the super added. Insults may affect the progression of the disease. If superadded infection, it may lead to perforation, or if superadded immune keratitis, it will lead to the vascularization and opacity, like in the the uh, the figure down left. So the other form is the disiform keratitis with a disc-shaped area of corneal edema, mostly without epithelial defect and with some uh, KPs uh, at, at this site. Uh, it's uh, 
purely stromal disease, also one of the severe forms of the endotheliites, with, which is related, or which is confined to the posterior part of the cornea, and there, uh, there is a demarcation line on the back of cornea between the edematous and the non-edematous areas. Uh, uh, here, the, the, Dr. Doa asked me about the hypopion in case of the varicarotides. Here, and just here, the combined hypopion with hyphema in cases with the complicated irate cyclites and trabeculites, uh, which is called the candy cane hypopion in case of the advanced or severe and posteriorly spreaded the uh, uh, hepatic keratitis. Treatment, it's, uh, it, it's somewhat controversial uh, about the duration of treatment, but I think we, we don't have any problem with the start. It, the medical treatment should include a cyclover eye, eye drops or eye ointment, or eye ointment, 3% a cyclover will, will be given uh, 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 five times per day in the first week and just two times per day in the second week and I have to stop it after after this time to avoid the corneal toxicity from the long duration of a cyclover. I will give in case of acute infection a systemic acyclovir as 400 milligram capsule four times per day for two weeks and then two times per day for another Two weeks after completion of this month, I will give it as a prophylactic treatment for uh, as as 400 milligram uh, per day for three months. The uh, I, I think if, if there is a non a, a bad response or non response to these treatments, you have to share. We have to shift the minds uh, to search about another cause because the viral keratitis should respond to these treatments uh, at the first times, at the first weeks of treatment. Otherwise, I, I, have, uh, I have seen a lot of cases uh, who came to me after a time, uh, uh, after a long time, around one or two months, on a cycle of their topical therapy. So when, when oh, and still complaining, so when I stopped this a cycle of their and, and gave them just lubricant, especially the preservative-free lubricants with some tonics, they, uh, they showed a, a mal malvarous imp improvement after that. So uh, we have to keep in mind the, the toxicity of drugs after adequate time of, uh, of treatment. The surgical treatment will be for the complication, and the most common complication is the residual opacity in the cornea. So I will do the, the DALC, if it's deep, uh, by the anterior segment OCT, or if full thickness, I will do the PKB, but I will wait uh, just one for, for just one year after the last recurrence and under the topical, sorry, under the systemic prophylactic treatment of a cycle of 400 milligram per day, just one time. Uh, if I have a superficial opacity at the level of the anterior stroma, I may think in the PTK, but I don't know what, what's opinion of my professors about that. If, if it will trigger and trigger the, the, the disease and lead to the recurrence, uh, again, I will uh, hear to, to their kind opinions about this uh, ways of treatment. Uh, thank you very much. I finished my presentation and I'm, I'm waiting for the, your comments. I'll typically do a, a PKP uh, because uh, a lot of the patients that I see have endothelial involvement too. And so we, I tend to do more PKs than DALC or ALKs. Yeah, okay. The last case uh, I, I have seen last week, uh, I, I, I brought this case. Uh, he's a boy around six years old with a long time with uh, after hepatic keratitis. I, I have treated the hepatic keratitis one year ago, and then this patient can see 624 unaided with this eye, with the central opacity, with the intermediate 
vascularization around this opacity from the middle stroma. So I brought him for the anterior segment OCT and putting in the mind the PTK, but when I found that there is full, almost full thickness of, uh, around 60 or 70% from the anterior part of the cornea is opacified on the anterior segment image. So I, 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 I turn it uh, to the, 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 the PKP, but I will try intraoperatively to do, um, uh, uh, to do the Miller surgery first. If I found that the decimate membrane and the, and the, the predesmate part is not included in the opacity, I, I, I will uh, do, if, if, if included, I will complete as PKP. Okay, thank you, Sonal. Thank you. Dr. Doga? So I, I would just like to uh, make one statement and I would like to have your opinion. You have uh, worked so much in viral keratitis. Now, if there's a yield viral keratitis with a superficial opacity, Dr. Hosam was mentioning about PPK. Um, there is uh, another, uh, one thing that, uh, you know, we all know that if there is any surgical insult or any laser or anything that we do, there is of recurrence is high. So, uh, will you do a PTK in such a case, or uh, would you would like to avoid, or? So I prefer oh, avoiding it. Uh, you know, and, and a lot of these patients with scars will see well with a contact lens, so uh, yeah. an RGP contact lens, and I tend to go with those. Um, UV light is actually a great way to cause recurrences, as we know. You know, people go out and get UV light, uh, they get sunburned. Um, in, in the U.S., you go for skiing, and a lot of people get fever blisters when they go out skiing because of the UV light that's reflecting up. So with PTK, that's the worry, is that the UV light from the, the PTK is going to cause a recurrence. If I do do it, I do it under cover of treatment doses of um, antivirals. So I'll put them on as though they have an infection, and I'll treat them pre-treat them for three days before and for two weeks after uh, they've had the PTK. Uh, but I try to avoid it and go more towards the contact lens. They're actually very comfortable with the contact lens because they're neurotrophic. So they, don't, they like the RGP contacts. You just have to be careful that they are careful not to scratch their eyes and things like that. But I prefer contacts to PTK in those cases. You know, th there are also many stress factors uh, other than just UV light. For example, uh, emotional stress and many of our young ladies we see during the monthly cycles, not only the iritis of the herpes keratitis, but even the keratitis will come up every month. And then we preempt that and we give them oral acyclovir, you know, just three, four or five days before the cycle starts, cover the period and then they drop it off. So there are some very uh, unusual uh, sort of associates with hormones as well. And, and uh, a whole bunch of theories as to why that might be so, but um, it's all how much the virus is contained. People have shown that um, there are a lot of these CD8 cells surrounding the trigeminal ganglion, uh, and they're, they're containing the virus inside, and any stress that depletes their numbers, it allows the virus to come out, and then you have to build that immunity back up again. So it, how, how that actually works uh, in the actual molecular mechanism is not clear, but these are the associations that have been reported. Yeah, herpes is definitely yeah. a very interesting virus. Yeah. Yes. It's a very smart um, virus. It has been a, there for centuries and we still haven't understood it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah let, let, let me uh, uh, tell you a short story. It's very short, Dr. Do, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had my dinner yet, you know. It's uh, my whole no, family. I, 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 I don't. I didn't have my dinner. Yeah, yeah. Yes. You too. <clears throat> so we we may have it together on on Zoom. Uh, with, with, yes. With my pleasure. Uh, I had I had a patient. Uh, one year after la after LASIK, with a good vision, uh, but with peripheral uh, epithelial defect, peripheral linear epithelial defect. I diagnosed him. Uh, 
uh, as a herpetic keratitis. I, I suggested that because uh, it's related to the, the cold. He, he, he had a cold and then uh, experienced this pain in, the, in, the, in the, part, the preferred part of the cornea beyond the flap. It's beside the flap, it's not in, in the flap uh, region. Uh, so I started with antiviral. But, but at the same day, for, for some reason, and, and you, you know, there are some relatives who may take the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the son to another doctor to confirm the diagnosis because I was a surgeon. So I, they, may, they may need to confirm my diagnosis uh, as, as, as a form of uh, um, psychological uh, rest. So he diagnosed the other surgeon or the other consultant diagnosed him as acanthamoeba keratitis. And I, I said to the patient, he was a pharmacist. I, I, I diagnosed, I, I captured the photo for his eye and showed it for, for him, linear and branching one. And he said that to the other surgeon um, who replied, they are the same presentation. Uh, what's your opinion? If, if you have the, such case, how to differentiate by, by one test between both acanthamoeba keratitis and viral keratitis, if you have a linear dendrite and branching sign, sign or epithelial defect like that. Uh, Dr. Rajesh, uh, acanthamoeba keratitis could present by this picture. Dr. Dovas uh, shown in the slide, in his, in his slides of that. See, a canthiopa keratitis can present initially with some, uh, you know, linear, uh, you know, epithelial changes uh, like Susan writes. But uh, if it's a viral keratitis, a simple test uh, will suggest uh, we can do a corneal sensation. Okay. It will be mostly suppressed in viral keratitis, but uh, it will not be suppressed in uh, canthiopa keratitis. Okay, perfect. I, I have mentioned this point in my presentation, but uh let let me review with you the the loss of sensation at at the beginning of the disease or after a time sorry the uh, loss not... the loss loss the loss of corneal sensation uh, will happen at the beginning at the first days of the hepatic keratitis or may take a time to to be no it from the very start one can have a decreased sensation but uh, what a, you had done a LASIK in this patient, right? Yeah, yeah, I had done, okay, I had had done, done one year ago. If you had done a LASIK, then he'll yeah, have very will, poor sensations yeah. in the yeah. flap yeah. because yeah. it depends on how many nerves but are coming. the duration, it will depend but, on duration. Then, yeah, it, uh, when one, was the LASIK yeah. done? One year, one year but before. One also, sorry, one year after LASIK? Yeah, one year one before, year. yeah. Oh, I, I, I thought it was immediately after LASIK. No, no. no. And you, where did you say the lesions were at the periphery? Yes. Was it at the hinge? Where was it at the edge no. of the flap? No, it is it's timbral. The hinge is superior. The hinge was. No, sorry, what I meant is, it was it around the, the, the circular mark of the LASIK flap? Circumferential, the yes. It's circumferential in between, between the LASIK border and the limbs. Yeah, so that's interesting. Mm. Okay, and and the patient. You know, we, because I, we know I that would... we know that when you get herpetic recurrence in a penetrating graft or in a dark, it is at the periphery, because that's where the nerves have ended after the the new graft has been put on, yeah. and and the host nerves are pretty much in there, and they take years to grow back. You know, you would look at these the pictures we published a huge amount of time, if ever. Sometimes they never grow back. And you will find aberrant regeneration of nerves only at the graft host junction. And that's probably where the virus is deposited as it's coming down the, the axons. So you will get more peripheral lesions uh, with, with these uh, in the graft host situation. So whether the LASIK flap is acting in a similar manner, though very much more superficial, we don't know. But the LASIK flap, again, if you look at the actual re it can be back to normal within six weeks or it may take six months or 
longer and will never ever come back to fully normal. So that could determine the location of the dendrites, but it doesn't help what you're asking, whether it is dendritic or acanthamoeba. I would have seen acanthamoeba would, would be you know, across, not just confined to that area. Yeah. There, there was in a, general, there was in a, general, also, if it's if it's a dendritic form uh, lesion in the peripheral part of the cornea, the first thing that comes to mind is viral uh, and not again the amoeba. Yeah, the patient wa was was feeling. Yeah, the patient was. You want to say was, something? Was feeling photophobia and pain. There's there was a ocular pain and photophobia. So uh, so I was. Um, uh, I was confused about that, but the picture itself, um, yeah, supporting my diagnosis of the viral keratitis. Let me to complete the story. Uh, the patient came again to me because uh, thanking Allah, he's is trusting, as and told me about the other diagnosis. And I I told him very comfortably, we can check the treatment. We we can use the antiviral for just two days. If there is no improvement, we will consider the cantamoeba keratitis. And surprisingly, after 24 hours from the antiviral therapy, uh, uh, the patient felt the, uh, the all improvements in the photophobia, in the pain, and also in the, I found that the epithelial defect uh, after, the, after, after 20 to 48 hours is almost healed. After just the a cycle where I ironed with the with the cobis lubricants, the same. This is the end of the story. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> all patients with a dendritic ulcer complain of irritation, lacrimation, yes. yeah. yeah. So you do. It's not that it's anesthetic day one. So yeah. initially, you do get symptoms of nerve irritation, uh, and then as you get recurrent episodes or if it persists for a long time then the nerves start uh, the nerve function starts to decline so you probably you know you can you won't get pain severe pain with uh, with dendritic ulcer but you will get irritation and photophobia it's like a foreign body yeah. sensation yeah so we have to check this in the coronal sensation uh, to, to uh, we, it will help us to uh, to confirm the diagnosis of the epithelial keratitis uh, the viral keratitis uh, right. Well, I think. Yeah. I want to thank all of you for spending this time with me and for teaching me all this. Uh, uh, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Hossam. I appreciate you organizing this. Thank you, Sonal. Uh, it's and, my pleasure. And, and nice to meet you, Sonal, on virtually. Uh, yes, sir. Of thank course, you. Rajesh, it's always a pleasure. <laughs> we were we were planning to meet in August in in Iskras, but the COVID changed the old plans. Yes. And also also Sona also Sonal is is planning. We we plan to we plan together to come to re, to come really to Cairo to pyramids. Yes. Not to be just a background. Yes. But I'll but I'll have the photograph uh, with the uh, the big uh, boulder. Yeah yeah yeah. And we will and we will be honored to to have you here in Egypt. Uh, professor, Thank you, Hassan. Professor Dora Bye -bye. is high is half you Egyptian, half, half Egyptian, I think, <laughs> because he is has a yes, early absolutely. English. Yeah, yeah, okay. Th thank Easily. you. Easily, only you. I have to now start learning Arabic. You know, I know <laughs> some words. But... Yeah, yeah. Then tell, tell, tell us. <laughs> yes. Yeah, tell us about some Arabic words. Okay. Now. Thank you. Now. Bye. -bye. Uh, yeah, uh, bye bye. He, he, he is not running. Bye, okay, bye. Sam. Bye. Bye, thank Hussain. You. Thank you, Rajesh, bye. and thank you for time. Bye, Rajesh. Bye, bye. bye. Rajesh, bye. Uh, I uh, I apologize. I think I know that you are so late in India now, but uh, re re perfectly all right. No issues at all. Really, I'm appreciating. I really your, enjoyed. Really I enjoyed. appreciating your uh, your participation and uh, uh, and and your efforts to be with us today. Thank you very much. And thank, thank, you. Th thank you. Bye bye, my dear friend. And see you, see, see you soon. And thank you for the old audience who are still with us till now. Thank you. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you.